peaceful and joyous uh, Christmas and New Year. Uh, we've had a fairly hectic year, so I think you all deserve a break. Uh, we'll see, see you all fit and well in January. That aside, you still have to work today. So, um, first item of the agenda, apologies. I've got an apology uh, from Councillor Glenn Campbell, and he's not going to be attending. Councillor Alan Reilly is attending um, funeral, but he will be in later on. I don't think there are any other. Uh, sorry, Earl Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll put an apology in for Councillor Robinson. He may be running a wee bit late, so I'll just put an apology for him at this stage. That's okay. Thank, Thank you, Chair. For that. Yep. I think that's everything. Uh, we'll go through uh, declarations of interest, item two on the agenda. Anybody got any interest to declare? Councillor Riley, Tom. Chair, at the uh, Paul McDermott uh, case, I'll be uh, leaving the room. That's okay. Thank you very much, Lou. Okay. We'll go straight into item three then, and that's uh, we've got four files to consider. First application is tied in with a second application as well. Is LA10 bar 2022 or 0552, and it's for listing building consent at 15 to 17 High Street, Oma. Darren? Okay, members, good afternoon. Um, so the first application then, uh, if we could run application number one and application two together, uh, I think it would make sense, members, if you're agreeable to that. Application one is LA10 2022 It's a list of building consent. Uh, at the property, and then application number two is LA10 2022-0553, and it's the full application. Uh, so the list of building consent then is proposed works, uh, including the alteration and extension of the building, and uh, the roof to the rear will be removed and additional floors added. And the 553, the full application then relates to the change of use of the, the building to a hotel, and includes then the extension to the rear of the rooftop leisure facility, and alterations removal as part of the roof again. The recommendation on both applications is to approve, so 220552 LBC, the recommendation is to approve list of building consent, and the 220553F, the recommendation is to approve planning permission. The applicant then is Ballymore Services, and the location is the High Street, 15 to 17 High Street, and 16 Foundry Lane in Oma. Just to advise members that uh, we have representatives from the Department of Communities online and they're available to take questions if you wish at the end. Uh, they're not included within the speaking rights, um, but if members during the discussion wish to ask questions from them or raise any issues, they are available uh, for, for comment if you want at the end. Well, just to take you through the details, members, so uh, this is the building then in question. So I'm sure everybody's aware of it in the, in the middle of Oma, the high street, as you go up on the left-hand side, approaching towards the courthouse, a large prominent three-story building just on the left. Okay, so the application site then that the applicants have applied for planning permission and list of building consent relates to the red line, and that includes the, the outline of the building itself. So it fronts on the high street. Uh, also then it, it's uh, parallel and fronts on to Foundry Lane at the side. Uh, and also then you can see that links through to Kelvin Avenue at the back. Existing plans in members, they, they are in detail, and there's a lot of detailed information on these. Uh, the existing plans are on the screen. I uh, uh, haven't included those in great detail because the proposed plans really are the critical, and they include the changes to the building. So on the left, there's a basement, uh, which is accessed inside the building down the stairs. On the right, then, is the ground floor where you'd come in. There's a first floor on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, there's an existing second floor, so you come up through the first floor into the second floor, which is just a bit at the front. Uh, and again, then you can see then the roof plan then on the right-hand side is just the existing roof. So I'll go through the, 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 the application in more detail, members, but just to set the scene here. So the building is listed, as you'll be aware from the report. Uh, the buildings either side are not listed, but the site is within the OMA conservation area, which is also an important material consideration. So the proposal then, uh, this is the uh, various floors and the changes to the building. So uh, the detail of the proposal then is on the screen. This is the basement then. On the left, you can see uh, the starting at the top, you'll have an extension out the back to an area of food preparation and storage area. You'll have an outdoor smoking area, toilets, covered outdoor area, 
uh, again, toilets within the central area of the building. And at the front then, in the high street um, frontage, you'll have the lounge and the lounge bar then. The ground floor then, you'll have the, you'll come in off the main street through the existing front door. And there'll be a lounge area there uh, with a dining area out the back. Moving up a floor then, uh, you then have the staff accommodation at the back, the lift, and there's bedrooms and all suites then on that floor. Floor above again, you have stairs at the back and the bedrooms and all suites uh, on that floor. Uh, again then, another stairs and floor of bedrooms. And finally then you get to the, the, the almost the top of the building, you have stairs then at the back and you have a balcony area at the back side of it as well. And then there are four bedrooms here, um, which seems to be two two bed units. But the stairs then lead you up onto the the balcony and the roof, uh, and you have the rooftop plans then as part of the application. So on top of the roof now, um, you have a um, a balcony area, uh, and the hot tubs and seating area. Uh, it'll be enclosed by a glass balustrade, which will go around that uh, that area at the top. Remember, as I say, just to set the scene um, of the, the location of the building within Oma, I'm sure you're very familiar with the front of it. Um, but obviously, the critical views then as you drive around Oma are, are important within the, the project and the proposal that's being presented to you today. So, the views then, uh, if you travel towards the courthouse, the building's on the left hand side. So, you can see the frontage onto the main street, but also, members, if you keep an eye on the roof detail on the top, so where the red arrow is. Um, because the roof does include this new terrace area where the hot tubs will be with the glass balustrade. So as we travel along and approach along High Street, bear in mind, members, this is from the middle of the road, uh, taken in a street view camera. So obviously things might be slightly different. On the left-hand side of the footpath, you had a different view blocked by the buildings. On the right-hand side, you'd, you'd be able to see more across to the, the building. But as you travel along, these are the views that you, you can see of the building. So now if we go up into Georgia Street and you're travelling along Georgia Street on the road, you come along the courthouse blocks, the building, uh, by and large until this approach, uh, where you can see the building sits in front of you. And you're at an elevated location there, looking down almost uh, on top of the building. So you can see the, the two large chimneys with the chimney pots on it uh, and the roof of the building and the balustrade root, uh, wall around the top of the roof. And then the building's either side of it. And as you go on down then, the levels change, but you can still see the, the chimneys on the, the front roof. Heading on down again, members. So the views then, if we go around then onto the Kelvin Road, uh, there's a view then through the, the post office, I think it is, through their yard. And you can just see the chimney pots and the walls on top of the, the rear of the property. Other views then are from the Kelvin Avenue. So if you're traveling down towards the Iceland store, you can see it on the left hand side. The building starts to come into appearance as you look past the Iceland store on the left there, down between the, the two buildings. You can see it there with the red arrow. So if you look up the alleyway members, you can see that's the back of the building. And that's the view then down Foundry Lane. And turning around then, coming up the opposite direction then, uh, past Boots, you can see then the building is on the right-hand side. Uh, it's also material, though, members, because it's a public car park, so um, there would be public views from this location. So the car parks then, both car parks, when you're in the, that area there, you can see the, the properties along High Street, and you can see the rear of the building. So that's one of the images then showing it. And again, then further up the car parks, looking across, you can see then the, the vista there where you have the Iceland store on the left and you have the, the line of the properties in High Street are, are visible across there with our property then identified with the red arrow. Again, just another image of it. So just to go through then some of the issues, members. So the front elevation will largely remain as it is. Uh, there'll be new doors and windows, um, but uh, they will be they will be reflective of the historic appearance and character of the, the building. 
Uh, there is um, a glazed canopy entrance to go over the two entrance doors, so the one on the left and the one on the right. Details of that have not been submitted, but they are conditioned to be submitted, along with final details of the windows and doors appearance. Up in the top, then you can see the two red arrow or two red circles, members. So, this is the uh, rooftop terrace uh, where there'll be a, an area created up there with the hot tubs on it. That'll be surrounded by the glass balustrades, as you can see there on the screen. So, those will be visible from the high street, from those approaches I mentioned, and also from the the rear from Kelvin Avenue. In terms of the rear elevation and the works that are being proposed here, so at the moment on the left hand side, a, an image showing the the drawing of the existing rear elevation and a photograph just on the right hand side. And then on the right hand side, members, you can see now the proposal. So the rear elevation then will be substantially changed uh, and that's accepted that the uh, character and appearance of it will, will be altered. You'll have to remove, the, the proposal will have to remove the chimneys and the rear cut slide roof it's called. Um, the building then will be extended out uh, and raised up in height to the same height as the existing building. And you can see the balcony then as well on the, uh, the top floor. And then there's one, as I say, below, or the roof terrace on the top floor and the balcony just below it. So as I remember, as part of that rear development, the chimney pot with a red star on it and the chimney with the yellow star will have to be removed. Um, and the cat slide roof, which is the, the bit of the roof projecting out uh, beside the red chimney, um, that will have to be removed as well. So obviously as a listed building and within the conservation area, the, the impact upon both of those is very important. And the applicant has submitted this drawing uh, showing a contextual view uh, of the, the building. So our site is outlined is the red line then. Okay, and then this is a, a contextual view of what the proposal will look like. So you can see the uh, red line then is the location of our site and how it will look within the wider character and appearance of the street scene. And remember, it's important just to look at the, the, the building itself in red with the buildings either side of it and the changes in and impacts that it will have upon the character and appearance of both the listed building and the conservation area. So that's a, a comparison between the two members. You can see the existing one on the left and the proposal then is on the right. Uh, again, members, just the slides just to ensure everybody's well informed of what the proposal is. So in terms of the other development then, the side elevation. So this is if you're in Foundry Lane looking at the side of the building. Um, th that's the, the side elevation. From the other side, if you're in the opposite side of the building, that's looking back in. You can see the uh, existing building facing on the high street with the extension out the back and the number of windows and uh, openings that exist along there together with the chimneys and the cat slide roof. So the foundry lane elevation, then remember, you can see the difference between the two. The right hand side is the existing and the left then is the proposal. So a fairly significant and substantial extension coming out to the rear, all the way up to the height of the existing building. Uh, and as I say, members, one of the key things here is the uh, roof. Now is a flat roof with a, a terrace on it, which is surrounded by the, the steel and glass balustrade balcony area. Uh, obviously, you'll note within the report the Department for Communities has raised issues in relation to this and the effect this all has upon the listed building. Uh, that's the side elevation on the opposite side. Uh, and then includes details of the proposed finishes. Uh, again, members, just for information, really, there's no need to go into great detail on it, but this shows a section through the building. The darker areas are the existing listed building uh, area. And then the uh, other areas then are the new extended areas. So you can see the, the extension coming out to the rear is substantial and significant in size in relation to the building. Um, but again, for the reasons listed within the report members, uh, in line with the words, wording of the transitional arrangements, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal accords with the SPPS and LDP for the reasons stated within the report, and it's recommended the application for listed building consent, the full planning permission should be approved contrary to the views of the statutory consultee department for communities. Thanks very much, Darren. We have speaking rights now. Um, 
Can you hear me, everybody? Yep. Uh, from Mr. Peter Dolan, the agent, uh, Mr. James McCallum, the applicant. Gentlemen, if you would like to draw forward to two of those seats. Just to explain, you have up to 10 minutes to make your case towards the committee. Either of you can speak, but if you're going to do that, would you introduce yourselves just to the committee? Basically, I know, Peter, I think you've been in front of the committee before, but just to do that, I'll be keeping note of the time. At the end of that, um, the committee may or may not want to ask you questions. If they do, obviously, you can, you can answer back. And once that's finished, I'll ask you to return to your seats and then we'll proceed. OK, uh, are you ready to go? I'll try and get you. No, no. There, there we are now. Yep. Where you go? My name's Peter Dolan, uh, architect with ADP Architects in Oma. Um, first of all, Chairman, thank you, and committee members, thank you for the opportunity of speaking here today. Um, the application is for the change. Sorry, of Peter. I'm just going to cross. You have supplied some confidential information on both applications to the committee. If you're actually going to refer to that, we will have to go into committee. Okay. Now, the members have a sight of that, so unless they want to actually interrogate you on it, you don't have to refer directly to it, please. No, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, the application is for the change of use to a hotel, including a rear extension, with a ripped rooftop leisure facility and alterations removal of part of the existing rear roof to the building located at High Street in Oma. The vision is to bring this landmark building back into its former glory and to turn it into a 22-bed boutique hotel uh, with a basement whiskey bar, outdoor bar and dining area, a restaurant, and finally a rooftop health and well-being area. The building is located in High Street, which is in the heart of the town centre and also in the conservation area. High Street is the principal street of the town and contains numerous commercial buildings with the highest concentration of listed buildings. The building is a Grade B listed structure, which was constructed around 1864. Its construction is an Italianate classical style, three-storey, four-bay frontage. The building has rounded arch windows to the ground floor with two side entrances in the same style, along with capitals with leaf ornament. The front is in sandstone with moulded string course between floors. The building was the former Provincial Bank of Ireland, in recent years, the property was used as an office building, but has been vacated since 1998. And also the building is currently on the Heritage at Risk Register. Um, the public face of the building at the front is to remain intact, with very little of this original fabric being altered. The proposed extension to the rear is very, barely visible from any of the key vantage points on High Street or Market Street. Any removals or alterations to the building is concentrated to the rear and is purely to facilitate the new proposed use and will not have any impact on the historic front facade on High Street. The massing of the proposed rear extension has been broken up and doesn't break the ridge line of the main roof of the building. The appearance will be similar to what is there presently using render and along with lightweight cladding panels. The backs of the existing buildings to High Street are made up of pitched roofs and flat roofs. Varying sizes of extensions and heights of extensions with brick or rendered finishes painted in various different colours. The back elevation to the building in question is screened at low level by the brick two-storey foundry lane retail units. The bedrooms, some of which will be the original building and some in the new extension, will have varying shapes and sizes with unique quirks due to the fact that the existing fabric has been retained as much as possible. The basement will be brought back into play with the existing brick vaulted ceilings, the Yorkstone paving and the riveted steel beams exposed for all to see. The original banking safe will be exposed and reused in the proposed building. The original historic fabric of the building, such as cornices, mouldings, staircases, etc., will be retained as much as possible. The proposed works will cost in the region of £5 million, which will all be private, local developer-led money. For the business to be viable, all the facilities proposed, including the 22 bedrooms, all need to be operational and supporting each other. 
The proposed hotel could do for Oma what the opening of the Merchant Hotel did for the former Ulster Bank headquarters in Belfast. Hotel was one of the few types of commercial uses in a town that can attract customers and contribute to the vitality of the street at all hours of the day. And that is important for both existing businesses and for the visitors to the town centre generally. This investment will retain and preserve the building, halting further disrepair. It will serve as a catalyst for the regeneration of Oma Town Centre and generate a much new need, needed use for this derelict former civic building. Oma has, had, has not had a dedicated town centre hotel since the Royal Arms Hotel closed its doors in 2002. And this is a much needed and indeed welcome investment to the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. James, do you want to add anything to that? You don't have to. No, I mean, I'm fine. no that's okay. That's okay. Thank you very much indeed. Well within the time. Members, do you have any questions for Peter or indeed James? Councillor McClockray, John. Thank you, uh, Peter. You, you mentioned there about the, the fabric of the building. I'm trying to save as much of it as you can. This is a building which hasn't been used in 25 years. And it wasn't in great repair whenever the, the government departments that were in moved out. So, I mean, at what stage of repair is this building in? Is, is it going to start deteriorating badly in the near future? Uh, and, and what condition is it likely to end up if this, this doesn't go ahead? Here's, it appears OK. Um, whenever you go into the building itself, um, you can you can see where the, the rain has come in um, through the, the leaking slates and the leaking roof. You can see where the pigeons have got in. And uh, in recent times, you can see certain elements of it um, quickly getting into bad shape and deteriorating. So uh, I suppose um, this proposal has come about now um, at the right time in order to preserve it. And um, I think it's important that the sooner we can get in and we can get uh, it made watertight and retain the existing uh, fabric as best we can, um, the sooner the better. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Stunned in silence, that's what I like to hear coming up to Christmas. Well done. Uh, I'll go back to Darren now for additional comments. Mm -hmm. And remember, we have members from HED in attendance. And they'll probably now, after Darren speaks, will present for a couple of minutes. And you can or cannot put questions to them. Okay, Darren. Yeah, members. Nothing further to add from the comments within the report. Um, I just like to reinforce and, and make it clear that the application is being recommended by planners, contrary to the consultee. Uh, the consultee is saying that, um, that they've carried out a safe visit. They've evaluated the application, uh, including a rooftop spa and the change of use, etc. Uh, and they're the view that it will be clearly visible in the key view. Uh, key views of the building from High Street, looking up towards the courthouse, uh, and they recommend the application is contrary to the, the planning policy HEO2 of our plan strategy. So the application is being recommended by approval by planning officers, contrary to the views and recommendation of the consultees. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, do we have members from HED in attendance? Yes, uh, Maeve Morgan here from Historic Environment Division. Can you hear me? I can. I can e e even see you, Maeve. That's Which isn't great. too bad. Look, uh, normally, because you're a consultee, you don't have speaking rights, but I'm prepared to actually, because of the issues involved in this application, uh, give a short presentation for a couple of minutes, just so that the members basically know where your objection is coming from. And the members then may want to quiz you, or they may not, uh, in regard to what you say. Okay. Thank you. Just um, a brief uh, summary of our assessment. Um, basically, the, the listed building um, is in a very significant setting uh, in the context of High Street and Foundry Lane. Um, these are both set out in the original first edition map. Uh, so we assessed uh, on this basis the significance of it in terms of its setting and any impact that the extensions would have on it. Um, in terms of the views up High Street, uh, as you know, there's a number of notable listed buildings um, 
namely the courthouse and then 8 to 20 High Street opposite, including other banks and the Tyrone County Club. So High Street, a very key view of the listed building. Then also uh, another key view actually from the rear of the listed building is on Foundry Lane, again, which was laid out um, probably prior to the first edition map. And there's a um, significant elevation at the back of the listed bank, um, which is viewed from Foundry Lane as you approach High Street, um, a series of uh, old returns, historic slated roofs and chimneys, which are a part of the essential character of the listed building and of um, special architectural and historic interest. Um, in terms of the proposals, um, we've been through a few iterations with uh, uh, planning service and the agents and are content in principle uh, with the development and are very supportive of this um, building at risk being turned into a 22 bed hotel with a spa facility. Um, in terms of how that related to our policy requirements under HE02, uh, we did, however, um, still have a number of outstanding concerns. Um, uh, firstly, um, we carried out a site visit and um, we um, had still concern with uh, the current proposals as they involved demolition of um, most of the rear returns and in particular a cat slide roof. Uh, and we thought that this would have a negative impact on the key views from Foundry Lane. Um, we therefore considered that um, if at least part of the cat slide roof could be retained within the extensions, that would lessen the impact. So that was our sort of concern with that aspect of it. Uh, and then the other uh, concern we had was in terms of the new roof spa at the top level. Um, we felt that um, the balustrading, uh, the hotel guests attending the spa and any lighting, etc., would all be visible from the key view um up high street uh and would be above the level of the historic roof line and uh, we considered that potentially reduction of the spa area or setting it back may lessen this impact and uh, we'd be very happy to take any questions or to to provide any further advice thank you thanks Maeve, for being so concise um i've squeezed you in um that's okay councillor mccann i think you wanted to there you are, you're live. Yeah, Obviously. thank you, Chair. It's more a procedural question, Chair. Yep. Uh, and the reason why I'm asking it is like, we all know who are at this committee regularly that there's a certain time frame to request speaking rights to address the committee. And I'm just wondering, you did say in your remarks at the start of the committee meeting tonight or today that the uh, reps from HED hadn't actually requested speaking rights. So I'm just wondering where in standing orders or the terms of reference this committee no, well, well, our, that our, was facilitated. Well, sort of convention, um, Councillor McCann basically in the past is if we have a consultee in attendance and there's a particular issue that needs specialist advice or input uh, to that, we have afforded without actually going through the formality of speaking rights, the um, ability uh, of the opportunity for members to actually um, interact with them. We've done it in the past about two or three times with a particular reference. We don't have speaking rights for consultees, but what we do is we facilitate uh, a discussion where there's a particular issue that needs to be addressed. And in this issue, because HED have objected to the application and our planning officers are actually going contrary to their advice on, on consultation, that's why it's they've been offered uh, the slot to actually a brief address, and it's up to us now as members if we want to pursue that or not. Okay. So we, we've done it in the past. No, that's okay. And I suppose just to, for completeness, I know Ch uh, Chief Executive, we brought forward the terms of reference for the amendments to the plan protocol at PNR last night, and this is not really in the in the protocol as such or terms of reference. So if it's something that we can do, I think you know just in the interest of openness of the of the committee. Proceedings, you know, Chair, because you know, as a stringent enough uh, process request and speaking rights, if you're in two minutes late after the deadline, you're not getting speaking. Yeah. And it's all in black and white, and that's the way it should be. But if there is this option for consultees to present to the committee ad hoc, at least be referenced in our terms of reference. Yep. Yeah. Duly noted, uh, Steve, and I'll do that and we'll look at that because we are looking at the protocols anyway yeah. to ensure that everything's fine. And I take your point in regard to that. So, Paul. Yeah, it's, it's just 
it's, it's a good point, Councillor McCann. It, it is covered slightly in the Planning and Committee Protocol um, uh, under point 1.4, and it talks about the environmental health and, and other officers with technical expertise um, may be required to attend the Planning Committee. No. If, if, if the committee needs to um, sort of draw on their exp expertise, they, they make a decision on any particular application, which uh, is the case in this particular application, you know, with the HED experience and, and the objections that they've raised. So it is covered, maybe not explicitly in, in, in detail, but it's, it's covered there within paragraph 1.4. Thanks. Great. Councillor McCrockery, uh, John, do you want to pose you. a question? Yes, I would like to pose a question. Um, Given the, the scale of, of this development, um, we've heard about the frontage, especially onto High Street, and the importance of, of that uh, Italian style of, of building. Uh, realistically, some of the, the how important is is this roof in the grand scale of schemes? Given that without the arrows, many people wouldn't even have known that that was the roof of the old provincial bank. Looking at the view of High Street from Calvin Avenue and different areas, uh, that many people wouldn't even have identified it as the particular roof of that building. How important is this roof that you're referring to in the grand scale of trying to see if the building, the, the general format of the building, which is what I would call the frontage onto High Street and possibly what you can see off Foundry Lane, whereas the roof, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really putting much weight on the roof because for most people looking at that, I don't think they would even have been able to identify it as the roof of that building. Thanks, John. Maeve, do you want to comment? Uh, there's two aspects to the roof which uh, we just had a raise of concern. When viewing from up from the bottom of High Street towards the building, um, the, the new spa area will break break the line of the existing historic um roofscapes on High Street, both the ridges and some of the chimneys. In fact, I think in some views, it goes above the, all the chimneys. Um, so that was a concern from High Street. And then Foundry Lane has a very attractive view. Um, basically, the backlands of Oma, unfortunately, have suffered a lot of erosion of their original character over the years. And um, this, is, this is one of the surviving uh, aspects of a star, historic uh, roofscape left. And it's clearly visible as you walk up um, Foundry Lane towards the High Street and gives um, members or uh, gives members of the public um, an appreciation of the historic nature of Oma, and um, that will be completely obscured by this scheme. So we were sort of raising the issue that if at least part of it was retained, um, it would have a lesser impact. Um, if, uh, we 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 can see that all of it can't be retained, um, or the the project probably won't be feasible. But at least if some of the historic roofscape could still be appreciated. From Foundry Lane, it wouldn't erode as much of the special character of the listed building. Um, okay, thanks, Maeve. John, anything further? You happy enough? Any further questions? No. Darren, have you anything further to offer? Oh, nothing further. That's okay. Thank you. We're down now to decision time, members. Recommendation on both these applications from the officers is to approve. Councillor Stephen McCann. Stephen. Okay, thank you, Chair. So I we've listened to the to the presentations and uh, I'm happy to propose the recommendations as listed in both them um, applications. And I just want to commend the, the the developer for the vision that he has for this particular site in Oma Town Centre. Uh, accommodation is a at a premium in this area, especially in the Oma site. And I know from my time on the event strategy working group that the uh, planning for flagship events in this area, especially around Oma, would have been curtailed due to the accommodation provision. So this will go some way to address that deficit. I think it's a great way of bringing a town centre building like this back into use. Uh, a note from Peter's presentation that the building is at a heritage at risk, or is on the heritage at risk register. So I know that the works proposed is going to keep the building in style to what was there previously and hopefully preserve it well into the future. The alternative would be, and I'd imagine that the building would become into a state of disrepair over time. So this is a, you know, it's a it's a great vision to to bring the building back into use. It'll rejuvenate the town centre, you know, it has to be welcomed as well. It's going to create jobs, you know, so I think it's a brilliant uh, investment for this area and I'm happy to propose the recommendations here. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor 
Divine Gallagher, Roshin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to um, second Stephen's proposal and second everything he's just said there now. So, um, it's me. It's okay. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Earl. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank the gentlemen for coming along here today and giving their presentation. And as also, we have listened for our presentation for HED there as well. So, we can make up our own minds in these matters. So, uh, now, as someone born and raised in Oma, and knowing the history of this building, and I can remember it as, the, as a bank, I can remember it as the Ledu. Ledu was there for a number of years as well, flying, flying basically derelict all these years now. And I don't want to see uh, a, a further disintegration of that building. Basically, it's going to fall apart altogether. So I'm happy enough to support the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. It's okay, members. I'm just going to inform you, members, because um, HED, the department, basically, the branch of the department, has objected to the, the proposal. If we as a committee uh, go with the proposal now and agree, so we approve, the proposal will be held until our officers basically communicate the fact to the department and see what their reaction is, OK? Uh, but you can approve or otherwise now, but it will be held. So we've got a proposal, Julie, uh, proposed and seconded, and that's to go with the officer's recommendation to approve. Are we all in favour? Any contraries? No, that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Darren? Okay, members. So uh, in relation to application number one, LA10 2022 list of building consent, and application number two, which is the 553, the full application, uh, the recommendation of officers was to approve. Uh, for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the conditions listed within the reports, members have granted listed building consent subject to those conditions and granted full planning permission subject to the conditions within the report. Thank you very much indeed. Right, we'll move on to application number three. That's LA 10 bar 2021 bar 1041 F and it's extension to the car park up at the Quilka Boardwalk Trail. Uh, Darren? Just a second, members set up. Okay, members, um, application number three then. Uh, is LA 10 2021 1042 is a full application for an extension to the car park uh, at the Kulka Boardwalk Trail. Uh, the applicant then is Jay Sheridan, and uh, the recommendation of officers then is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the eight conditions. So, members will recall this application uh, was presented in November and was deferred uh, to allow members to visit the site, uh, and then was also presented in February 23 with a recommendation to refuse. Uh, the committee deferred the application to enable further discussion between planning officers and the applicant and agent. Those discussions have taken place and amendments have been received along with information. And uh, consultees have viewed that information and the application is now returned to you with a recommendation to approve planning permission, as I say, subject to the eight conditions. So in relation to the application, the, it's off the Marlebank Road, uh, the ent existing entrance in the existing car park. Uh, which you can see there uh, on the slide. You can pass the existing car park and just go on to the track, and it's on the right-hand side of that image, identified by the arrow there. So the entrance then, members, just to, to the detail of it. So the entrance will be widened, and DFI roads have asked for this, uh, and it's a reasonable request given the traffic volumes now. So the entrance will be right, will be widened uh, to allow vehicles to get in and out uh, with good visibility on either side. Um, the proposal does include a new fence, uh, galvanised gates up at the entrance, here we can see the details of those on the right hand side. They're not really appropriate for the rural area. So uh, although it's on the plans, there's a condition really that the uh, gates uh, are to be agreed with planning officers uh, afterwards if a recommendation of approval is brought forward. So we'd get something more sympathetic to the rural area. The site itself then uh, is located on the screen. You can see on the left hand side, you recall from the site visit members, the, you come along the track and it's an area of land just on the, on the side of the track. There's a plan showing the existing uh, levels and topography. Uh, so it identifies the gradients and slopes, etc. 
and the proposal then has been amended to, to reflect the uh, topography of the ground uh, and to avoid the uh, raised areas uh, and take advantage of the natural slopes. So it's roughly level uh, throughout the site, so no real changes to the gradients is at that, that 190.5 or, or there or thereabouts. So no real changes or any uh, alterations required. And what will be proposed then will be a mesh laid down on top of the existing ground uh, which will be filled in then and the vehicles then can drive in and out on top of that. So the introduction of the mesh will result in the loss of the habitat that's on the site. It will not grow up through the mesh. Uh, that habitat will be lost. Um, the ground can be reseeded but it will not be the original priority habitat that exists at the moment. So again members just to be aware of the location if you remember from the, the wet day that we had out there. Uh, you know, through the gate and then up the track and it's just on the left hand side there so these are a couple of slides presented by the, the applicant in support of the application. Uh, in terms of the ecology uh, it's an important material consideration uh, this is the ecology report the summary from it um, so the um, the site is on a priority habitat purple moor grass and rush pasture uh, so there's no debate or, or question about that it is priority habitat in terms of the quality of that though, the ecologist identifies that it's of low quality in comparison to the rest of the field. It's extremely short and semi-improved through high grazing levels. Um, the site is within a larger field parcel which comprises an extensive mosaic of high quality habitats. Uh, the summary also includes mitigation then and you'll note from the report that that is uh, included. It wouldn't be mitigation, it would be compensation given that the habitat is lost but the um, the alteration of the alternative area will provide similar area of habitat which will be managed and maintained uh, to avoid grazing uh, and uh, best practice then to create a high quality habitat which will compensate for the loss of this small area uh, of habitat that will be lost. <laughs> um, obviously members the consultees in relation to this application are very important uh, previously the council consulted and has got, received comments from NIA as I said previously they had said there was an impact on earth science features uh, in other words, the limestone pavement. However, that has all been now resolved uh, and they are content there's no impact on earth science features. However, the proposal will result in the loss of priority, priority habitat. That's the purple moor grass and rush pasture. Uh, and as I say, the ecologist has commented on that and the NIA have not challenged that. The area that will be lost is 0.013 hectares within a, an 18 hectare field, which is uh, the Marlbank SSI itself is 1,408 hectares, so it's a very, very small area uh, of habitat that will be lost within the SSI. Um, for the reasons listed in the report, the loss of the low quality habitat will not adversely affect the integrity of the SSI. Uh, there will be benefits from the provision of the new area of car parking, and as I say, an area of compensation will be provided. Um, NAA, though, have also commented on the impact of vehicles uh, from their emissions and how that will impact upon the lichen assemblages bryophytes, fungi and invertebrate assemblages. Um, but for the reasons listed within the report members, it's not considered that the development of the car park will have an unacceptable impact and there's no conflict with the planning policy. So although NAED strongly recommend refusal of this application uh, for the comments on screen and in your report members, the recommendation of planning officers is to go contrary to the, the uh, comments of NED uh, and to recommend approval for the, the application. So for the reasons listed within the report and uh, subject to the wording of the transitional arrangements of the regulations when reading the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal accords with the SPPS and local development plan for the reasons stated uh, and it should be approved contrary to the comments of the statutory consultee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're speaking right now the agent and applicant. Unfortunately, the applicant, Mr. Sheridan, can't be with us. It's just the agent, Mr. John O'Brien. John, you dress up. You've been in front of the committee before for your sins. Uh, you know you have up to 10 minutes to present. Um, and we, You may be asked questions, you may not afterwards. So I would just... Okay. There you're live. Away you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman and members. Um, thank you again to the committee for giving us the opportunity to address you for a second time in support of the application. Although Mr Sheridan and I have spoken right, he has been called away, so I will speak for a couple of minutes and endeavour to answer any questions you may have. We have been here before and put forward our case for an extension of the car park at this location. 
We were successful in an application on land adjacent to this for toilet facilities, but in many ways the two applications were interdependent as to make a major invest investment in infrastructure and the ongoing maintenance costs, you need the numbers to stack up. The booking system John Sheridan set up will only be entirely successful if we can cater for 80 to 100 cars on the site, and the present one only caters for around 40 to 50. And this has led to cars being using unauthorised spaces, putting people's lives in danger, as we mentioned before, with pedestrians mixing with vehicles along the access track and along the Marbank Road. We picked the application site as the most suitable, given its flat nature, and we could position the spaces within the natural features with no loss of small outcrops, rock outcrops, etc. The site is adjacent to the existing approved car park and could be described as an extension of SIEM using an existing entrance, which will be upgraded as required by DFI roads. But Darren said the application site is very small, measuring 0.013 hectares in an area of 14 hectares, 1,400 hectares, representing 0.00092 of the SSI. The committee deferred at the February meeting to enable further discussion between the planning officers and ourselves. And in April, we submitted an amended plan, greatly reducing, reducing the proposed site area. And this was in consultation with Paul Kelleher's report, as he had felt the initial application for car parking failed to recognise some key earth feedings, such as the dough line and the snake hole, shake hole to the rear of the proposed area. And after a meeting on the site, he suggested a better layout for the car park that optimises the natural landscape and protects the dough line from damage or runoff from vehicles. This will include a fence setback area between the dough line and the parking being formed and allowed to naturally rewild, most likely with hazel. His report goes on to state that the habitat last loss underneath the boardwalk itself far exceeds the surface area of the applicant's plan for development at Vagna Brocky. And there is extensive um, evidence of tramp, trampling of the blanket bog as large numbers of people pass each other on the way up and down to the mountain. The booking system manages the number of walkers on the boardwalk at any one time, so this will improve the situation. NIE and his consultation response makes note of the limestone pavement. Having surveyed the site, Mr Kelleher confirms that the limestone feature lies 100 metres to the east of the track and well outside an uphill of the proposed development area. He notes that a well-designed car park taking into account the concerns of NIEF re regarding the dough line and other art features, which he concurs with, would be well hidden from the public road as well by the existing hazel thickets compared to being an eyesore on the landscape anywhere else on the marble bank on the Marbank route loop. NIE advised that due to the loss of priority habitat and the impact for from vehicle emissions upon lichens and the impact upon the ASSI, they have strong concerns over the proposal. But the removal of the upper car park at the bridge, maybe half a mile up the track, it's been removed and that will have a net positive effect on the emissions through reduced slow moving traffic on a hilly unsurfaced track. In addition, the additional rewilded, rewilded areas will increase overall hazel scrub habitat. In the comprehensive report assessing the application against the Fermanonoma District Council Local Development Plan, we find that the proposal broadly meets the policy tests and we'd like to acknowledge the engagement of Darren and his team to bring the application forward with a recommendation to approve. Thank you again for listening and we ask you to support the recommendation. Thank you very much, John. Finished within the time. Well done. Members, any questions for John? Yes, Councillor Philly, Anthony. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, John, for, for that presentation. And, and Darren, Darren did mention this when he was talking there as well. I'm just, I don't know, it's not going to affect any of the planning. I was just being curious when you mentioned you were happy with the galvanised gate. Is, is, is the fence that's going to be erected going to be galvanised as well? And if, um, say, you, you think you may put the wooden gate, or that on will be kind of curious looking at the gate and the fence is not matching, or would we as well have the two things the same? It's just been a wee bit curious, wonder what it's going to be looking like. You know, if, if it is just the same. So that's the question to John, isn't it? Yep. We're rebuilding the stone wall at the entrance. 
moving it back to get the sight lines and to get the width of six meters. So it'll be stonewall each side. Really, the gate we put up there was a security gate that he has had to he has had people um, entering the car park when it's been closed. Remember the toilets originally the border looms were burned on that sort of thing. He wants it to be fairly secure, but we'd worked with the council to get a, a gate that suits everybody. That's brilliant. Thank you, John. Any further questions? Don't see anything. If you could dress back to your seat, John. Thank you very much. Darren. Uh, again, members, no further comments or anything. It's just to remind members that we are, uh, planners are putting forward a recommendation to approve the application contrary to the consultee's comments, but for reasons listed within the report, and the recommendation is to go with an approval subject to conditions. Thank you very much. Councillor Philly Anthony. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd just, just like to propose, propose the recommendation. I think um, much needed car power is needed up there, and it'd be good to get it, so I'm happy to propose. Thank you very much for that, Anthony. Councillor McClockery, John. Thank you, Chair, and I'd be happy to second. I'm glad to see that we finally got this project over the line. It's been a while getting here, but it's always good to see if we, can, if we work together, we can get some of these things completed. So, second. Those are sound words, John. If we work together, we can form and get uh, an agreement, which we have in this case. Any further proposals? No further proposals. So I've got a proposer and seconder, and that's to go with the officer's recommendation to approve. All agreed? Agreed. That's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Darren, can you sum okay, up, please? So, uh, application number 3, LA 10, 2021-1042. Uh, the recommendation of officers was to approve planning permission uh, for the reasons listed in the report and subject to the eight conditions. Member of grant, members have granted planning permission uh, subject to those eight conditions. Thank you very much indeed. We'll move on now to application number four, and that's LA 10, bar 2023, bar 2177, and it's a nightline application. Darren? So, members, application four is LA 10, 2023-2177. It's an outline application by the Department for Communities for the renewal of an outline planning permission uh, for a shared mixed-use and mixed-tenure housing regeneration scheme. Uh, the site is to be developed for residential use with associated open space and amenities, including play areas and allotments. The location then is at Grosvenor Barracks, Coal Hill Road, and in Eskilm. And the recommendation of officers is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to 29 conditions. So I'll take the members through the details in a second. Just to remind you, the application was first approved under LL11 to 2011 0079. Uh, the application then was renewed under the LA 10 2020 uh, and this application is seeking to renew it again. The change in the uh, policy context with the publication and adoption of the plan strategy uh, has been taken into account in the renewal. So the recommendation in the report does refer to the new plan strategy policies and has introduced a number of new conditions. In terms of the application itself, members, um, so the site itself is a fairly large site uh, beside the public road and uh, it's outlined in red, uh, as you can see there, with an area of blue then across the road, also in the control of the Department of Communities, but not part of this application site. So just overlaying that then on the aerial photograph for members, I'm sure you, you know the area well. Um, the red line then includes is approximately the, the location of the, the site to be developed. Uh, it's on the old uh, army camp, and you can see the remains of some of the hard standing areas uh, on the aerial photograph. Although it is an outline application, there is an indicative plan showing the, the layout. So those two entrances coming off the public road into the development. And the site itself is fairly steep sloping on it. Uh, and the houses then will reflect the, the, the topography of the site and the slopes, with the lower land then at the top of the slide along the watercourse being retained uh, and used as public open space within the area that's affected by flooding. As I say, just there's a, a severe slope on the site, so topography and sections have been provided. So you can see A, B, C, and D. So again, although it's an outline application, the, the applicant has provided these to show and demonstrate that it'll be a quality residential development. And the site will be recreated and uh, platforms created with suitable uh, areas of private amenity space that are reusable, but also ensuring there's no harm to the amenities of any existing neighbours uh, and uh, good degrees of separation and no overlooking. Uh, you look from the report members at the time of the report, NI Water had been consulted and had not replied. Uh, they now have replied and are recommending refusal. Uh, they advise that there is capacity. I'll put the comments on the screen there, members, if you can 
make them out, but I'll go through them anyway. So the NI Water have replied saying there is capacity in the receiving wastewater treatment works, but there are network capacity issues. Uh, that relates to the pipes getting from the site to the wastewater treatment works. The downstream catchment on the, the pipe network is overloaded and there are unsatisfactory intermittent discharges known as UIDs. Uh, so UIDs have occurred, uh, these impact on the environment. They are recommending refusal of the application subject to the applicant engaging with the NI Water. Um, but if they do engage with the NI Water, NI Water may reconsider their recommendation to refuse. Um, the applicant, they advise that the applicant needs to contact NI Water and submit application for a wastewater impact assessment. Uh, so, members, in this case, as with other applications that we have, there is wastewater capacity in the receiving wastewater treatment works. It's getting there is the issue. That is something the applicant will have to go away and agree and discuss with the NI Water. That can be done outside of the planning application process. The recommendation of officers is to approve the application with a condition on saying they can't actually build beyond subfloor. If they can't build beyond subfloor, then there's no connection into the public network, so there's no impact, there's no harm. If they can't get agreement with NI Water, they can't go ahead. It's over to them. It's not a matter that the council really should hold the application up uh, and wait until this is all resolved. So that condition is on members uh, as a, as a, a pre-commencement condition uh, and will be monitored by officers. Um, so that overcomes that issue. So although the council T NI Water is recommending refusal, the view of officers is to go contrary to their recommendation. So for the reason listed within the report, and in line with the wording of the transitional arrangements, and when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal accords with the SPPS and LDP for the reasons stated, and should be recommended for approval, uh, is subject to those conditions. Thank you very much, Darren. Any questions for Darren in that regard? Sir Thompson, Earl? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Darren for his report. Just wondering, if Northern Ireland Water hadn't come back at, at within the time, uh, have they given any excuse for their lateness in coming back to us or anything like that? Thank you, Councillor, for noting that. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, as a renewal of an application, it wasn't until late on in the report uh, writing that I realised they hadn't been consulted because uh, renewals, they were consulted before. And uh, so that was sent out late in the day. So thank you for drawing that to members' attention. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I would do that. Thank you. Eagle eyed, uh, Councillor. Well, uh, Councillor McCann, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. It's just a question. I don't know if Darren or anyone would have the answer to it, but I recall in the recent past, not that many years ago, there was an issue with, with sewage, I believe, up around that area, the Danny's Mill Road. Mm. Uh, is that linked into that general sewage issue that's been referred to by NA Water? Uh, you know, would this application, if granted permission to go ahead, would that want to compound the issues there or maybe resurface them again? You know, or, what was the issue there again? Maybe I, I just, is the point worth raising now? Yeah. And so it's important to remember, members, this is a renewal. So this application was approved and renewed, and this is now coming in to be renewed again. So in NI Waters uh, assessments, this would have had to be taken into account previously under the very first 2011 approval. It's not a new application coming in uh, that has to be considered with all the rest of so They were in first, essentially, and have been renewed over time. Uh, uh, it will be an issue between the developer and NI Water to resolve. As I say, it's a matter we have conditioned, and I don't think there's any need for the council to get involved in that. But just from a local information, I'm sure Councillor McGuire would say that the issue with regard to Downing's Mill Road, I think, has been resolved to a certain level. Um, there was an issue, I think, several MLAs and all were involved, one of them sitting in the room here, uh, I think, along with several others, eventually got resolved. But from a topography point of view, the discharge from this proposed site is the other side of the hill. So it will um, connect into a different uh, sewer line run. So it won't necessarily go in uh, on the back of Danny's Mill. Danny's Mill falls one side and this side falls the other way. So that's just the way the ground is. Right, Councillor McLaughlin, John. Thank you, Chair. If nobody has any other questions, I'd like to make a proposal. Go ahead. Chair, I'm proposing that we go with the officer's recommendations. I am disappointed to see this project back in front because of the publicity and uh, the went with it when it first came before Council. And it's that long ago that I was actually still working when it first came before Council, so 
it's come back a few years, six or seven anyway. So uh, hopefully this time it'll not have to come back to us again, but uh, I, I think it, it's something that's still still needed in the area. Yeah, sure. It will have to come back to us, John, because it's only outline. It'll come back for reserve matters if it actually goes ahead. Fingers crossed. So you're proposing, Councillor Thompson, Earl? Uh, thanks again, Chair. Thanks to Darren for his report. Uh, I'm prepared to second this. Uh, I know that area quite well, and uh, I'm prepared to second uh, subject to 29 conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further proposals? No. So I've got a proposer and seconder, and that's going with the officer's recommendation to approve the outline application. All agreed? Great. Thank you very much. Darren, could you sum up, yeah. please? So application number 4, LA 10, 2023, 2177. Uh, the recommendation of officers was to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the conditions. Uh, members have granted planning permission subject to those conditions, including the comments and the condition about the uh, provision of the means of sewage disposal. Uh, which is in as condition 24. Thank you very much. Now we're going to uh, item four, and we have three files called in. The first application is LA10 bar 2023 bar 1330, uh, an outline application for a dwelling and detached carriage on a farm. Okay. Tom. Darren. Councillor O'Reilly, just for a matter of record, has declared an interest and is withdrawing from the chamber. Okay, members, so application number one, uh, LA10 2023 slash O. It's an outline application for the erection of a dwelling and detached garage on a farm. And uh, the location then is approximately 60 metres southwest of 120 Ashnadar Road in Rosslea. The applicant then is P. McDermott. Uh, the recommendation then is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report uh, and subject to four reasons. Let's take you through the details, members. On the screen then is the site location plan. And you can see the site then identified in red uh, along the uh, the laneway with other lands then in the control of the applicant in blue. So the larger field that the site sits in is in blue. And then the fields opposite number 120 there, you can see they're like an L shape. Uh, those are in blue as well. well. The applicant has provided a farm map. And that's included on the screen. You can see there are three fields. So one, three and four uh, identified on that farm map. And if I just zoom in, you can see then the, the location of the, the fields that are included on that farm map, members. In terms of the, the site itself then, uh, the site's in the, roughly in the position of the yellow star on the screen. And you can see the location then beside the existing buildings, uh, including the property across the road uh, and other nearby buildings. Putting that onto the uh, aerial flyover image, the site is the yellow star so it includes that area where the bales are stored at the moment and also then part of the field behind that the um, farm buildings then are to the right hand side of the yellow star and then there's a dwelling house immediately beside that across the road then is a third party property and you can see its location in relation to the application site so members just to zoom in on that a bit closer so you can see then the bales uh, and the buildings, the farm buildings, and the house then on this side of the lane, the bottom side of the lane, with the third party dwelling then across the other side of the lane with its garden and cartilage. So uh, I don't propose to go through it in detail, members. You will be aware of it, but the application is uh, a proposal under HOU 11 as a dwelling on a farm business. And uh, at the policy test centre set out within the purple text box. Uh, with the policy then accompanied by policy clarification, uh, as you'll be aware, members, then below that. So we have various paragraphs then clarifying the policy, but the policy itself is set out within the purple text. In terms of the issues then, the application before you, members, is for a, a house uh, on a farm. And the policy then requires the applicant to demonstrate there's currently an active and established farm business uh, for the last six years. So 
The application was received in January 23, so six years from that would be January 17. Um, but it is the date of the decision that will be material. So the application has been in uh, for some time. And really the years 2023, 22, 21, 20, 19 and 18 are going to be material uh, as the application has been in for an extra year. So you're really looking at the years 18 to 23 and for the applicant to demonstrate there's currently an active and established foreign business. In relation to that, the policy uh, is um, HU11. As I say, the Council will support applications for a new dwelling on the farm business, which is currently active and has been established for a minimum of six years. The policy clarification members uh, accompanying the policy says one of the clearest ways of demonstrating that farm business is currently active uh, is by providing the, the DARA business ID number and evidence of receipt of entitlements in support of the application. So the by and large, most applications the Council gets we get this in, you get the farm maps and the P1C form, which provides the name and the number of the farm business number. Uh, the council then consults with DARA, who come back and provide comments on that. In this case here, the application is accompanied by information, uh, which states that on um, DARA's reply also confirms that on the 19th of November, 91, so Bernard Robert McDermott, otherwise known as Sonny, with an IE or a Y, members just a McDermott, uh, was issued a farm business ID from DARA, so November 91. And the applicant, the current applicant then, uh, Mr P McDermott, has provided this business number in their application form and the council has consulted with DARA. The reply from DARA uh, on the 3rd of February 23 states uh, that they confirm the farm business ID number has not claimed payments through the basic payment scheme or agri-environment scheme in each of the last six years. They also advise that the proposed site is located in land that is not under the control of the farm business identified in the application form, as the land was claimed by another farm business in 2002. Uh, further, they also advise that the business ID in the application closed due to the death of one member business. So just to go through that in some detail, members, so you're, you're fully aware and fully informed, the farm business, the farm application is accompanied by a farm business number. That farm business number was allocated in 1991. But DARA has now come back and say that that business number is closed due to the death of that farm member. So the DARA business number we have in is closed. In relation to that DARA business number, the, that claimant did not make any claims for single farm payments, etc. in each of the last six years. So if we take today and work back six years, they haven't claimed anything, plus the business number is now closed. So essentially the, the DARA business number supplied with the application does not demonstrate there's a farm business which is currently active and has been established for the minimum of six years. So the dairy business number is if there's no assistance to the applicant. However, that is not fatal. The clarification accompanying the policy goes on in paragraph 3.49 and states, where applicants do not have a business ID number or evidence of receipt of entitlements, then the applicant must submit full accounts, details of any agreement which are linked to the farm business. So you can still get a house on a farm if you don't have a farm business number. The farm business number is purely to get um, payments off DARD or DARA. It's not to demonstrate that you meet the plant policy. That information is used to demonstrate you meet it, but the failure to have it or the uh, an old one being closed exactly is not the end of the world. You can then seek to demonstrate that you have a farm business in other ways. One of those is to put in your farm accounts if you have them. And if you have them, you put those in. If you don't have them, then you can move on to look at other evidence. And in this case here, the applicant has submitted a Conacher agreement. And that is dated the 1st of April 2022 and runs for a term of five years. It's between the applicant, Paul McDermott, and Brent O'Rourke. Um, the agreement, and I've just pulled out the information there, members, on the screen. So the agreement, dated April 22, runs for a term of five years, states that the tenant, so that's Brent O'Rourke, so he's the farmer, the tenant shall cultivate, upkeep and manage the lands in good and husband-like manner throughout the period, along with other activities, including not overgrazing, etc. The agreement also states that the tenant shall ensure that all external fences and hedges are upkept in good stock-proof condition, and that all gates and cattle grids are upkept through the said term, and shall ensure further that all internal hedges and fences are likewise upkept throughout the said term, and are properly clipped and fit for purpose. So members have put that up on the screen because the, the Conacher agreement is a date in April 22, lasting for five years. It states what the tenant will do, and the tenant is going to cultivate and keep the lands, look after the fences, look after the hedges, cattle grids, etc. There's no evidence that the owner of the lands will do any work at all.
to manage and maintain the land in good condition. The tenant will have it for five years. It's not a period and then back to the landowner and back to the tenant. It's an open-ended period of five years. So the agreement demonstrates that the tenant is responsible for keeping the land in good environmental condition over the five-year period. The landowner rents the land to the tenant for the five-year period. So moving on then to the next stage, members. So the dire business number is not of assistance. The Connect agreement is not of assistance. The uh, next opportunity then that an applicant normally uses is to provide invoices to demonstrate that they're keeping the land in good environmental condition. So again, um, when you look through the invoices and statements and receipts that have been provided, um, those have come in, those have been shared with members and you have those. They cover four businesses over the period. Um, so there's uh, receipts, invoices, statements from 2014 right through to 2022. Again, no members, it's really from 2017 on. Uh, so the last six years is what we're looking. So 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23 are obviously critical. Um, you can see there on the left hand side members, um, in 2023 we've no receipts, invoices or statements. 2022 there are four, there's nothing in 2021, there's five in 2020, there's nothing in 2019, three in 2018 and nothing in 2017. In addition to those invoices and statements, the applicant has submitted an affidavit, uh, NI water bill, a details of insurance and covenant details of the land in support of the application seeking to demonstrate that yeah, there is a farm business and they're managing and maintaining the land. For the reasons listed within the report, that does not demonstrate that there is currently an active and established farm business uh, and the lack of um, information, especially in the years this year, sorry, the years 2021 and 2019, um, there's no invoices at all. There's no information at all. Uh, the applicant is also making the case though that there has been a break in the farm business. Uh, and again, the policy clarifies those situations. Um, so where there is a break in a farm business, for example, due to the bereavement or a change in business numbers, then evidence of the historical farm business along with the details of the current farming activity must accompany the application. So in this case, there's no change in business numbers. It's uh, the previous business number that is there uh, in the name of uh, Bernard Robert McDermott or Sonny McDermott it was granted in 1991. And as I said there, I have advised that that has, has ceased. So there's no um, change in business numbers. There hasn't been a new one issued to the applicant. In terms of the business number itself, um, it stopped then with the, the death um, of the, uh, the owner of the business um, and there hasn't been a new one issued. The history of the lands then is on the screen, members. So 91, you had the uh, uh, DARA business ID number was it given to Bernard Robert McDermott. In 2014 to 2021, uh, BR McDermott was unable to farm the land and lease the land to C. Rooney and Conacre. In March 21, B.R. McDermott died. And then in April 2022, the applicant P. McDermott leases the land to Brenton O'Rourke. And uh, Brenton has his own farm business number, but this application is not using his. So the history of the lands, there's no evidence that of a change in business numbers. There's no evidence of a break insofar as the previous one stopped. And most importantly, evidence of the uh, details of the current farming activity uh, in relation to the application is missing those years. So a lot of information in there, members. It's all set out in the report in detail, uh, and that just summarizes and goes through that all. You have the received the, um, the invoices and supporting information in an unredacted form, and that has been made available to you. So for the reasons listed within the report and in line with the wording of the transitional arrangements uh, and the regulations, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the uh, the SPPS or the plan strategy for the reasons stated, and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved contrary to the plan strategy. It's recommended the application is refused for the following reasons. Uh, it's not a rounding off opportunity or an infill opportunity. It would result in suburban buildup of development, and the farm business is not currently active and established for a minimum of six years. Right, thank you very much. We have um, speaking rights now, and I'm just trying to read them off here because we've got speaking rights from the applicant agents, political representatives, and an objector. So the first one is by the agent and the applicant. If I could ask Mr. Robert Bryan and Paul McDermott and Ms. Jane McDermott to go up to the seats, please. Yep. 
procedure is you have 10 minutes, uh, up to 10 minutes between yourselves. Um, if you could introduce yourselves going forward, I know you've been here before, Robert, but uh, the applicants haven't if they're going to speak. And again, uh, it's just a reminder, you can introduce no new evidence here. Basically, it's only what's in front of the committee and that has been provided to um, our planning officers. Are you good to go? Okay, I will. There you are. Okay, Robert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Robert Brown, agent. Um, this outline planning application was applied for as a erection for dwelling and garage on a farm. And it comes under policy HOU 11 of the Local Development Plan 2030 plan study, which is implemented on the 16th of March this year. Under this policy, it states that the application needs to meet certain criteria. Firstly, the proposed site must be on a farm business, which is active and established for a minimum six years. The policy states that the farm business has to be active, but not necessarily that the owner has to be an active farmer. The land was formerly owned and farmed by Mr. Bernard McDermott until his death in 2021. He had a farm business ID from 1991 until his death, 21. He had let the farm on Conacre from 2014 to 2021 to Mr. Cahill Rooney, who claimed the single farm payment on the land. Mr. Paul McDermott inherited the land in 2021, and Mr. Rooney continued using the land on that year on Conacre. In 2022, the land was leased to Mr. Brendan O'Rourke on a Conacre agreement, and he claimed single farm payment on the land that year. The policy states that there, where there is no farm business ID number or evidence of receipts or of entitlements, then the applicant must submit full accounts and details of any agreement which are clearly linked to the farm business. DERA will be able to confirm that single farm payments have been claimed on this farm business continuously for the last six years, although not under although under two different farm business ID numbers. We've also produced bank account details and receipts from Mr. Paul McDermott confirming that he has bought materials and goods for use on the upkeep of the land, which has been taken on Conacre. I would refer you to a recent application, LA 10, 2023-1369-0. Sorry, Robert, I have to interrupt you. You can't cross-refer. That information is in front of okay, our officer. that's fine. Sorry. That's all right. Okay. Um, well, I've just... Um, the case offers have stated that the principle of new farm dwelling will be acceptable under criteria A and B, and likewise, the uh, uh, McDermott's application should be considered the same. Secondly, the proposed site is sited immediately west of a group of farm buildings, and therefore criteria C, clustering, required, is fulfilled. This has been confirmed in the case officer's report. The proposed site is flat, and any new dwelling will not be unduly prominent on the landscape. Again, this is confirmed in the case officer's report. The planning department have listed several reasons for refusal, which are one, contrary to policy HOU 13, paragraph one, rounding off, two, contrary to policy HOU 13, paragraph two, in filling, and three, contrary to policy DEO 5, rural character. Surely these reasons are not applicable to this application and should not be included as it was applied for under HOU 13, dwelling in a farm business, and that is the only policy we have to meet. The case officer states at the beginning of his report that these other policies would not be considered in this application. We feel we have demonstrated that the farm business has been active for more than six years and therefore planning permission should be granted in this case. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any, anybody else uh, wanting to speak? You don't have to. I'm just, I'm just posing the question. Yep. Okay. There you go. Could you introduce yourself, please? Paul McDermott, applicant. Mr Chairman and committee members, I am the current owner of my ancestral family homestead at 120 Ashley Road, Drummer Haver Slay, land that has been in the McDermott name for over 100 years. This is my second attempt to obtain planning permission on the lands in order to be able to gift my eldest daughter the site so that she can get onto the property ladder. She is struggling to get a mortgage and a percentage of deposit is so high and she is engaged to be married next year. She is a practicing solicitor in Enniskillen and would very much like to stay in the Fermanagh area. In Bernard McCardle's email sent to my agent on the 2nd of June 23, he states that the only reason this application was being recommended for refusal was that it was contrary to policy HOU 11, in that it hasn't been demonstrated that the farm business has been established for six years and is currently active. In my view, the policy is ambiguous and is open to different interpretations. Nowhere in the policy does it say that the applicant must be the active farmer. It actually states in paragraph 3.51 that where there is a break in the farm business due to bereavement, then evidence of the historical farm business along with the current farm, farming activity 
must accompany the application. I believe we have satisfied these requirements. Policy states that one of the clearest ways to demonstrate a farm currently active is the evidence of the receipt of entitlements. In, in my view, this emphasises the ambiguity in the policy, as anyone who is familiar with farming will know that entitlements and land ownership are not connected. You can hold entitlements and not have land and vice versa. The policy also states that land owned and taken as Conacher qualifies. The lands in question are let in Conacher to a farmer and the Conacher agreement was submitted in evidence together with evidence of the payments for same. That brings me to the part of the policy that recommends where an applicant doesn't have a farm ID number or receipt of entitlements that there must be a full set of accounts submitted. The policy doesn't clarify what constitutes a full set of accounts. Obviously, a 100-acre farm will have a lot more detailed and extensive set of accounts than a holding of just 11 acres. One of the fields is entirely surrounded by a fence with concrete posts and a derail fence, therefore no need for hedge cutting. One of the reasons the tenant farmer takes the land in Conacher is to give him greater capacity to empty, to empty his slatted tank by spreading slurry on the lands. Therefore, no evidence for this type of work either. In the planner summing up, they state that the invoice for lime was submitted, but no proof that it was used on the lands, the said lands. I have a video on my phone showing the loading and spreading of the lay on the said lands. The policy states that the farm business is one that demonstrates that it enjoys the decision-making power, benefits and financial risks in relation to the activity on the land. I put it to you that I have decided not, if I decided not to let the land, then there would be no farming activity on it. But I do decide to let it in order that it's kept in good, environmentally friendly fashion, and there has never been a break in the farming activity on these lands during the past 100 years, and it was a dying wish of my late uncle that I would allow this to continue. In summary, I can say that in my view, this is a genuine, honest and compliant application for planning permission for dwelling on a farm, and I urge you members to consider this favourably and grant permission at this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Finished within the time. Members, any questions for either Paul? Oh, Jane, do you want to? Yeah, 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 you have a couple of minutes. Go ahead, I'll just... Thank you, Chairman and members, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I am Jane McDermott. I'm the daughter of the applicant, and should this application be granted today, I would hope to reside on the lands after I get married next year and raise a family there. I am one of very few young solicitors in Enniskillen, as many of my colleagues have moved to Belfast and beyond. The ability to build my own home in Fermanagh on land that has been in my family's name for over 100 years is a huge incentive for me to remain here for employment. It appears that it is becoming increasingly harder for families to obtain planning permission on their own land, which will only contribute to the brain drain away from rural areas like Fermanagh. We are already seeing the impact of this across many professions with threats to close Enniskillen Courthouse um, and indeed the SWA. In my view, young people are likely to settle elsewhere if they cannot obtain planning on lands that have sentimental value. With it becoming more and more difficult for first-time homeowners to get on the property ladder, my father's assistance in obtaining a site would mean that I could remain in Fermanagh and contribute to the community here by way of my profession. The applicant has already indicated how he enjoys the decision-making power, benefits and financial risks in relation to the agricultural activity on the land in the affidavit submitted. I wish to reiterate that in the absence of a business ID number, the applicant has submitted invoices and receipts which demonstrate active farming for such items as draining stones, agricultural lime, fence paint and weed killer. I understand that this evidence, along with the relatively low threshold for what constitutes active farming, satisfies the requirements of HOU 11. A copy of a farm select insurance policy in respect of the holding has also been submitted. It is clear to see that the land and hedgerows within the holding are being maintained in good agricultural and environmental condition. Albeit a substantial number of these invoices are dated within the last three years, it should be noted that the previous farmer of the lands had a burden of the deeds, which you will have had sight of, stating that as he has the exclusive use of the lands for stated that he has the exclusive use of the lands for agri agricultural purposes, which is up until 2021 um, when he died. Invoices for his period of active farming have been provided along also with evidence of his historic farm business number. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finished within the time. Uh, members, any questions for the applicant or the agent? Okay. Councillor McGrath, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. Um, business, the farm business ID number, has the applicant ever had a herd number or his uncle associated with the business ID number? And uh, Robert said there about uh, 
that the applicant had applied for a new business ID number. What, where is that at at the minute? And you know, I'm just thinking, you know, has the applicant ever had a herd number associated with the business number? Thank you, Chair. Okay, two questions, Paul. Uh, the uh, Bernard Robert McDermott did have a herd number. He farmed the, the land. Up until 2014, it says in the submission that until he was unable to do so, that might you might think because uh, physically it was partly physically, but also that was when the DERA changed the entitlements. Where the unless you were actually farming the land, you couldn't claim the entitlements. It had to be the farmer. So he had then decided that he would let it out in Connacher, but he did have a herd number right up until he let it in Connacher. Yeah, and in relation to the herd number. But, um, my son has shown an interest too in maybe raising sheep or cattle, and I've been getting assistance uh, to um, get him a herd number under the Young Farmers Scheme, which is um, in currently underway. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, next speaker, Councillor Feely. Anthony. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Robert, Jane, and Paul, for your presentation. The, no, I just didn't quite pick up the Paul when you were talking. You were saying. I know it, there's not that many hedges on the land as a fen trend, so you'd, you'd have no um, contact or in cutting hedges or the like of that, but you've mentioned all about slurry. Is, was it the guy that takes the land, or, or did, did he get a contact about the slurry? If he was getting somebody to put out the slurry and so lame, it's, if, if there's any bills for that, would have been useful. Is there any bills for any of that kind of stuff? I just didn't catch what you said there, just was wondering if any bills. Um, in relation to the lame, Myself and himself agreed. I bought the lime. I provided the invoice. I've got a, a video on my phone showing it being spread, but I didn't know how to. I know we can't um, introduce any new um, stuff today, but I didn't know how to send a video through to the planning. But um, I have it on my phone. I paid for the lime. The tenant farmer agreed to pay for the spreading of it because he knew the guy that does spread it. In relation to the slurry, the tannin farmer, he has his own tanker and he empties his tank and, and he spreads it with an, umbil an umbilical um, lead. Yeah, because I'm very exact about the land. I don't want it to be tramped or I don't want to have heavy machinery on it because um, my late uncle, he worked for Prunty Contracts, Prunty Pitches, and the land was his pride and joy. It's drained to the last. It's kept. You wouldn't see lands like it in the country. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McCann, Stephen. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Paul, Jane, and Robert. You're very welcome to the committee. Uh, I'm not from a farming background directly, so uh, just maybe if you had me understand the entitlements. Um, am I right in saying then so that there's been entitlements claimed on that land for the last six years, albeit two different uh, two different uh, farm numbers? But that's been claimed the last six years. Okay. In terms of the insurance policy that's referenced, what is that insurance policy actually for? Is it public liability or, or is it uh, for farming use or what? You know, what sort of policy is it? It's, um, it's a farm direct um, policy with the farmers union. It's, it covers the agricultural buildings, machinery, and it's not it's not public liability. You know, I have liability under the house insurance, but uh, it covers all the farming buildings and machinery on the on the farm. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Not seeing anything. Could I ask you all to return to your seats, please? Next up, we have a representation from an objector, Mr. Malcolm McClave. Are you online, Mr. McClave? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, I can see you now as well. Um, Again, you have 10 minutes to present um, your representations with regard to your objections. Again, as I said to the previous speakers, five, oh, so it was very five minutes. It was, yeah, five minutes. Um, you can't uh, introduce anything new uh, into your representations with regard to what's already been lodged with um, our uh, officials. And at the end, um, our members may or may not wish to uh, question you with regard to representation. Do you understand? Yes, I do, Chair. Okay. If you're good to go, I, I'm timing you, so you've got five minutes, okay? Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members of the Planning Committee. My name is Malcolm McLeod, and I live at 180 National Dar Road for the past 10 years. I am here today to introduce myself and explain to the committee why I am objecting this application and why the application should be refused. Due to the five minute speaking limit, I can't discuss my objections in detail, 
So we're outlining fact-based salient points that will allow the planning committee to make a more informed decision based on material planning considerations. Firstly, I agree with the planner's assessment and the group decision that this application should be refused as the proposal does not meet the policy for a dwelling in the countryside. It fails to comply with the criteria for a dwelling on a farm, an infill dwelling and a dwelling in a cluster. Furthermore, any dwelling will impact upon rural character. If we look at WHO 11 dwelling on a farm business, it states that the council would support applications for a new dwelling on a farm business which is currently active and has been established for a minimum of six years. If you read the file, you would see that the planners have said that the evidence submitted does not demonstrate that a farm business is currently active and established for a minimum of six years. In addition to not demonstrating that the farm business is active, DERA have said that the proposed site is located on land that is not under the control of the farm business identified on the application form, as the land was claimed by another farm business in 2022. Finally, policy states that the application site should be located on the farm holding that has formed part of the farm business for a minimum of six years from the date of the application. This is not the case in this application, as it has been let in Conacre since the 1st of April 2022 and thus fails this part of the policy. The application was first recommended for refusal on the 2nd of June, 20 weeks after the submission, as the proposal was contrary to policy WHO 11, dwelling on a farm business of the planned strategy, in that it had not been demonstrated that the farm business is currently active and has been established for at least six years. This was the expert opinion of a group of planners, not just one opinion of the case officer. The second time that a recommendation to refuse was mentioned was on the 22nd of June, when the case officer notified the agent that the business has not been active or established for a minimum of six years. Council therefore intend to progress the application with a recommendation to refuse as soon as possible. On the 4th of August, 2023, for a third time, the senior planner notified the agent that it is considered that the evidence is not specifically linked or associated with the farm business and it does not demonstrate that a business has been established and operational the required six years. It should not take three attempts to inform an applicant that a proposal is contrary to policy. Apart from WHO 11, there are three other planning reasons planning has been recommended for refusal as evident on file. It fails to comply with any policies in the plan strategy relating to a house in the countryside, and the proposed site would cause a detrimental change the rural character of the area and result in suburban style build-up in the environment. The planners have told the agent three times that this application does not apply with policy and legislation. They have now officially put the recommendation in writing. As outlined already, this application is not an inactive and established farm business and therefore cannot be considered a house on a farm. It also does not meet any of the other criteria for a dwelling in the countryside. Before you today, there are four reasons for refusal regarding this application. And as this file has been called in, each of the four reasons individually will have to be addressed. According to the planning committee protocol, if any of the planning committee members are thinking of making a decision contrary to the planner's recommendation to refuse. One minute left, Mr. McLeod. Pardon? One minute left. Thank you. Sorry. If anyone, according to the planning committee protocol, if any of the planning committee members are thinking of making a decision contrary to the planner's recommendation to refuse, it must be backed by sound, clear and logical planning reasons linked to the planning policy as that decision could be subject to judicial review. Plus, it could allow past applicants to seek to have their files reopened as they may have been refused in these areas. The planning committee must decide from those members who are supporting any contrary proposal to the planner's recommendation who would be prepared to defend the committee's decision in court. I request that you as council do advocate your personal responsibility by voting strictly on party lines. You have a personal and an individual duty to consider the issues involved and to reach your own decisions. To make any contrary decision to the planner's recommendation to refuse this application would be irrational. The, policy, the application does not adhere to policies SP01. I'm out, right, Mr. McClave, I'm sorry. Thank okay. you. No, thank you very much for your representation. Uh, members, any questions towards Malcolm?
don't see anybody wishing to um, pose a question to you. So thank you very much indeed for your representation. Thank you, okay. Chair. I'm going on now. I've got political uh, representations here from uh, Mr. Tom Elliott, MLA, and Councillor Barry McElduff. If you could dress up to the two chairs. Barry, if you move across, Tom. Hopefully, you will have uh, decided among yourselves who goes first um, because you've only five minutes between you. So, the younger one starting is or the older one? I'm not sure which. <laughs> <laughs> Seniority, right. Okay, thank right, you, you Chair. Thank yep. you. Um, firstly, I would like to uphold the democratic aspect of planning as well, you know, following on from a previous speaker that elected representatives thankfully have an input into decision making, people that know their own communities like the back of their hand. So, my first point would be whether or not there is an active established farm. I'm pleased to note that the applicant has provided significant number of invoices and supportive information. And also, I was struck uh, when becoming familiar with the case that the applicant does retain and enjoy decision-making power, benefits and financial risks associated with the, the farm. Secondly, I want to say that also a strong point is that it has no adverse impact on visual amenity. Um, to me, it read like a positive, again, an advantage in the context of criteria C regarding clustering and visual links that the site reads in the way that it does. You know, I, I read a positive in that, not a negative. Thirdly, I would say that I found Jane's testimony very, very powerful. Um, this is not a speculative site to be sold on, but for a family member, a young professional who wants uh, reasons to stay in this council area and uh, contribute to uh, our community. The 110 rule applies neatly here as well. And finally, I would say that I want to note that there are no environmental health issues of concern, no overlooking. And I'm also struck by the fact that the red line has a, an expansive portion of land and that the final design and layout is to be sorted later. Thank you, Chair. Well done, Barry. You stuck within two minutes. Not like your normal. Thank you, Tom. Hey, thank you, Chair and, and Committee. And just a very couple of brief points around the agricultural activity. And uh, clearly, this site is beside a farm group, as is noted in the planning officer's report. It is beside the farm group, which includes uh, art buildings in yard and livestock handling facilities. So clearly there is a farm unit uh, already established there. Uh, the policy does refer to uh, the regulation EU number 1307-2013. And again, Article 4, and that goes into some detail on the agricultural activity, uh, which talks about the production, rearing or growing agricultural products, maintaining an agricultural area in a state which makes it suitable for grazing or cultivation or carrying out minimum activity defined by member states on agricultural areas. So there's a, a number of options there that can be used. Uh, and in fact, Darren, uh, the, the planning officer that we heard from, in his letter response yesterday uh, to the objector, did say uh, that the policy does not set out how an applicant must demonstrate that there is currently an active and established farm business for at least six years. And there are a number of ways of doing this. For example, evidence of claiming of entitlements, farm business accounts, or, or evidence of keeping the land in good agriculture and environmental condition, which is exactly what the applicant here uh, has been doing for a number of years. Uh, planning appeals on a number of occasions, and indeed uh, this council has approved applications and planning appeals categorically state around the regulations, that EU regulations, that it is, in a quote, it establishes a relatively low threshold for what constitutes agricultural activity for the purposes of this policy. That's followed uh, regularly by the planning appeals and indeed this council in the past, and indeed in the past seven months, 
have approved uh, applications for uh, uh, dwelling on a farm holding without a business ID. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well done, Tom. Finished within 30 seconds, both of you. Congratulations. You can turn to your seats, please. Doubling. <laughs> and we'll not make that public, Councillor Michael Duff, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, Darren? Uh, okay, Mr. Just uh, I don't propose to go back through all of the issues, members. I'm happy to take any questions, but there were a few things raised there uh, just to, to comment on those. Uh, there was a query uh, raised by the agency about why the other reasons for refusal have been included within the report, uh, which was surprised at because I have clarified that with the agent in an email previously, so he should know the answer to that. The, whenever we're going through the applications, members, planning officers will try and use all the policies to assist applicants. Uh, that includes clustering and infill and although you may have applied for a farm dwelling if you don't meet the farm dwelling policies but you're an infill the infill can still be approved you know we can still go ahead so it's important to set out all the issues for members uh, and let them know so surprise that in terms of the applicant not being the farmer for example um, the, the applicant does not need to be the farmer uh, i can apply i'm not a farmer the key thing is it's a farm business so that's the central point of this application is it's the farm business that is being scrutinized it's not the applicant, it's, uh, it's the farm business. And the policy itself then does talk about the um, farm business, which is currently active and has been established for the minimum of six years. So in demonstrating that the, the Tom is correct, there is a low threshold, but you still have to demonstrate there is a farm business. Um, that can be uh, including the submission of invoices and receipts for keeping the land in good environmental condition. There's no problem with that. We have routinely as a council approved those uh, and that'll continue in, in the future. In terms of the PSE, they look at those and there's as many approved as there is dismissed. So there's no clear pattern from them. But when you're submitting invoices and you're submitting this information, you have to demonstrate beyond sort of reasonable doubt that you have a farm business, that you are maintaining the land. As I said to you, there are a number of years where there's no invoices. There's no information on that. This year, uh, we go back to the the Connecker Agreement. So from April 2022, the applicant Paul McDermott has a Connecker Agreement with Brent No Work. Brent No Work is doing all of the maintenance of this land. So from April 2022, the question has to be asked, what is the farm business doing, if there is one? What is this farm business of the applicants doing to maintain the land? From the evidence before the planning officers, nothing because Brent No Work is doing it all. So hopefully that clarifies the members. I'm happy to take any questions. So. Thank you, Darren. Questions for Darren? Thanks, McGuire. Hi, Gorman. I'm going to carry. Thank you, Chair. Just, just a question on that, uh, Darren, there on uh, the low threshold for proof of, of a business. Uh, Mr. McDermott has a Cornacre agreement with Mr. Rooney, is it? Or sorry, Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, proof of the financial arrangement between uh, Mr. O'Rourke and uh, Mr. McDermott. To me, that would indicate uh, a, a business arrangement with benefit, which would mean there's a contract between the both parties. Now, within a contract, the Cornacre description there that he is actually, uh, the tenant has taken the responsibility of, of looking after the land. Uh, that still doesn't say that Mr. McDermott ha isn't taking responsibility for improving the land because he has a contract with Mr. O'Rourke with benefit, which constitutes a legal uh, uh, agreement as far as I'm aware. So is that not the lowest possible threshold, I'm, I'm aware of that, but still that would indicate there is a contract between uh, the applicant, the tenant farmer, that can be proven with the financial benefits that he achieves. And that, that, that would show financial benefit, still taking responsibility for the maintenance of the land through the contract that he has with them. How, how far does that stand with you, Darren, please? Uh, ultimately, members, that's a decision for you. You'll have to make that and stand over that. As planning officers, I would say that that's going way beyond what the spirit of the policy is looking to do and what we're doing here. For example, if I owned a farm of land and I rent it to you, 
I'm not a farmer. I have no farming involvement whatsoever. I just get a financial income from you. You're doing all the maintenance, so looking after the hedges, cutting the grass, etc. You're doing all the maintaining the good. I'm doing no maintenance, and I'm not keeping the land in good environmental condition. All I'm getting is money. That's the planning officer's view. Your view, you can decide what you want to do here, but I would remind you, members, it has to be a reasonable view, and it has to be based on the evidence before you. Uh, well, a couple of, uh, in response to that, Chair, uh, this, this problem came active before the planning committee back about 2013, 2014, when this uh, transfer of uh, the finances from DERA to the active farmer, the, the, that has further complicated the situation, and this is exactly the, the a critical one here. So, uh, again, maybe some legal guidance in how far that we can uh, to bring uh, the contract and whether that constitutes financial benefit, etc. Uh, just on, on the back of the question I, I pose, Chair, please. Are you looking for a comment from Anne-Marie then? Right, okay. Marie. Yes, thank you, members. Um, I suppose it's, it's also contained there with it when Darren referred to the policy and the clarifications. So, and I'm just really rehearsing what um, Darren has already spoken about. And um, if there's the no claims within the, the six years and there's no the, the business ID, then you that's not fatal. You can provide the full accounts or you can look at the agreements and the invoices, but it's looking at those in detail and taking a balanced judgment as to what they represent. And I suppose that's that's really the decision for members here. Oh, Paul? Yeah, and members, I suppose, just, just for clarity, I don't think the Conacher Agreement co covers all the missing years. It's from year 2022, Darren. So there's two missing years even before the Conacher Agreement. So. The, I suppose the judgment on the Conacher agreement still won't address the six-year period, so it's just to be mindful of that, members. Councillor McCann, did you want to come in? Today's my legal chair. No, it was, and then went off, and I just so you're happy enough. Yeah. Any further questions for Darren, members? You're active there. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. I, it's just uh, to get a comment from Darren back to the entitlements and uh, six years of entitlements. And I think they've displayed evidence in their presentations that there has been six years of entitlements claimed on this particular piece of land, in addition to obviously the accounts as well. But if I just get a comment, I know Councillor McGuire touched on it there as well uh, about the owner versus the applicant of uh, of the land. You know. Uh, and in terms of who's claiming uh, entitlements, so just get a comment again, Darren, about that. It's just going to be a bit lost in your in your comments there, the last time. Uh, so, in relation to the entitlements, they're linked to the DERA business ID number. So, if I have a DERA business ID number, I apply to DERA to get those entitlements. I can then provide that DERA business ID number to the council, and that'll demonstrate that I have a farm business. So, in this case, if I go back to the names here. If you look on the screen there, you can see, so uh, from April 22, P. McDermott leases the land to Brenton O'Rourke. He has his own farm business ID number ending at 17. We are not being provided with that farm business number. So because Brenton O'Rourke hasn't agreed to give his 1 in 10 to this applicant. Brenton O'Rourke will have his own 1 in 10. He can do whatever he wants with it. So the entitlements that are being claimed by Brenton O'Rourke are of no assistance to this application. What is the key thing before you today, members, is, is there a farm business on this land? Well, there's somebody claiming subsidies. Yes, that's Brent O'Rourke. So he's the farm business. So what is the applicant, who's Mr. McDermott, what is he doing to maintain the land in good environmental condition is essentially the question before you. And as I say, the lack of receipts for those years that are missing and the Conagher Agreement demonstrates that there's not a farm business here. And Chairman, just to follow on, if we can, is it fair to say then so that uh, the, the applicant, Mr. McDermott, would have sanctioned or would have signed off with Brendan O'Rourke to do that work for him? I can take that interpretation because that's what he's doing. So the, the, the Conacher Agreement, it's uh, it's on the screen there to say I've cut and pasted out the bits in it that really relate to the maintaining the land, good agricultural condition. 
and it clearly states that from April 22, uh, Brent O'Rourke, no the farmer, using his farm business number, uh, he's taken over the land, he's claiming the subsidies, I understand, and that's what it says he'll do. He'll cultivate, upkeep, manage the land good and husband-like manner throughout the period. So the Brent O'Rourke no is the one that's maintaining the land in good environmental condition. As I say, the to date, this council has never accepted the Conacre Agreement as demonstrating the farm business on its own. We've had examples where people have come in with the Conacre Agreement and then said, outside of the Conacre Agreement, I look after the hedges, I look after the fields, I cut the grass, and here's all my receipts. And that's fine. But this example before you, there's none of that. This is a five year agreement where a third party farmer takes over the land and maintains it and looks after it. There's no evidence of the applicant through his farm business maintaining the land in good environmental condition, especially since April 22, when it's clear Brenda Rourke doesn't. Any further questions, Stephen? Not much just now, Chair. Thank you. Members, the, the quandary in front of you is, I think the applicant um, made uh, an application under HEU 11 for a dwelling um, and garage on a, a farm. And it's the issue of trying to establish um, a farm business. There has been a break in ownership and that's been referred to by the agent and the applicant in regard to the previous long-term owner dying and then the applicant uh, taking it that, that up. So you've got information in front of you. You have to decide whether that is sufficient. In the officer's opinion, it is not sufficient. There are gaps. But essentially, you're the decision makers, and you've got to either agree with the officer's decision or on balance of the evidence provided uh, that you will go contrary to the officer's opinion. If you go contrary to the officer's opinion, as highlighted by one or two of the uh, speakers, you will have to justify uh, the stance that you've taken and why you've taken it uh, on planning grounds. Okay. And so we can't. Uh, you're live, Stephen. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, there's been a lot of discussion on this application and uh, indeed previous farm applications as well around active farming and what constitutes an active farm. And uh, it is accepted, I suppose, that there is a low threshold of what you can uh, provide, which determines an active farm. I accept that the McDermott's have been farming this land for hundreds of years, not just the last six years. And uh, I accept that, there, that the, the land is still in their ownership and there's an active farm business on the land. Uh, I accept that the evidence that Paul has presented in terms of the accounts that there's a derail fence pension there where okay, you don't have to cut the hedge every year, so you're not going to get an invoice every year from a contractor to cut the hedge. So they're limited as to the evidence that they can provide that they are actually maintaining the farm. I think that they've done their best to provide accounts to, to display the, the requirements of the policy. Uh, so I propose that we do uh, approve this uh, recommend the application chairman uh, against the officer recommendation and grant plan permission. Thank you. What you're essentially saying, Councillor Cam, before I let you go, um, is that in your opinion, and you've weighed up the evidence provided by the applicant on behalf, or the agent on behalf of the applicant, that the evidence provided, in your opinion, uh, ensures that there is continuity of control and therefore an active farm business for the minimum requirement. I could do that better myself, Jim. Well, you could try, but Thank probably you. wouldn't. That's okay. Uh, Councillor uh, Devine Gallagher. Yeah, I've, I've, I've um, listened to the different evidences here tonight. Um, they, um, the fact that, that insurance has been paid on, on, on a business uh, shows me that there is a business um, farm there. Um, so I would like to thank the second recommendations by Stephen. It's OK, thank you very much. Have we any further recommendations, proposals? Um, I, before I let Darren back in, I will say Councillor Rainey um, entered um, halfway through the discussion and he is not entitled to actually take part in the voting. So that's just for noting on the record. Darren? Uh, yes, members. Uh, as I say, ultimately it is your decision. Um, 
what uh, what happens to the application. I can only provide advice and guidance, but uh, I can't uh, stress in strong enough terms how different this is to previous applications that we've had before us. Uh, planning officers do not consider the evidence before you demonstrate as a foreign business. It is your decision ultimately, but the absence of those years, the Conacher agreement, etc., all demonstrate that there is no foreign business here that is currently active. In relation to the um, just the farm insurance details that was mentioned there by Councillor Devine Gallagher, uh, just to refer you to the report, the insurance, um, the insurance uh, does not give any information on what is insured, other than a section which refers to farm buildings and machinery, and it does not include the full six-year period. So it's important to say that, members, but uh, as they ultimately it's your decision, um, however, there is a second reason for refusal, Councillor McCann, just in relation to the, the uh, impact on the character. Um, so, condition, reason number three, the proposal is contrary to the DEO5, uh, as the proposed site would cause a detrimental change to the rural character of the area and result in a suburban style build up. If you wish, I could go through that uh, with, and then you have an opportunity to comment. Is that the best way? Okay, so on, on the slide, it wasn't really discussed much during the presentation, but on the slide, members of the aerial photograph, you can see the yellow star is the location of the site. So it's beside the existing farm buildings and the, the house centre the side, and you have those other houses in nearby, including the objector's property directly opposite. Uh, the view of officers within the report is that approval of a dwelling in here uh, will result in a suburban style build-up. So the increase in the number of houses, when you view those with the other buildings in the area, would change the, the rural character of the area uh, and create a build-up of development. McCann. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would disagree in terms that this is uh, obviously a farm is in a rural area. This is a farm dwelling. It's it's a dwelling on a farm. It's sited next to farm a farm group. Uh, there is a number of houses already on that particular road. You know, uh, I think that this house will have proposed or if if uh, obviously proposed and, and built, it'll complement the area uh, to a certain extent. Um, the I would just I would disagree Sorry. with the planner's yeah. interpretation that it would uh, it would uh, constitute so more before you go any further, Stephen, uh, finish off. Darren, could you bring up the photograph, the the the, the closer one that shows the round bales? Yep, that's it. Yep. Yep. I'm happy with that, Chair. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and further to that, this application will not generate any potential further development opportunities either. You know, so I'm content that this will integrate uh, in my interpretation of the plan and policy, Chairman, uh, into the rural area. That's okay, great. Uh, Councillor Van Gallagher, you're agreeing with that? Yeah, I'm going to agree with that as well. Also, Darren, you'd said the insurance policy um, didn't run for the extension of the six years. Um, do you know how many years it did run for? Don't have it, to don't, be honest with you, but it's not the six years. But it's the six years that's required, and it's not the six years. But you don't know how many. Do, no, no. I can find that out for you if you want. Now, but, yeah, um, yeah, you could. That'd be great. Thank you. If you want a deferral, do I find that out? No, um, no, no need. No thanks. Any other proposals, members? Right, I've got a proposer uh, and seconder that is going against the officer's opinion, and the proposal is to approve, um, subject to conditions, if um, agreed by the committee. And the proposer and seconder have provided reasons for overturning the arguments for refusal. How do members vote? Are we all in agreement? Right. Could I show of hands for agree, please? So noted. Uh, against? Abstain. Two abstentions. Okay. Answers. Thompson and Mahan abstaining. All others are in agreement. Uh, Darren? Okay, members. So the recommendation of officers was to refuse planning commission uh, for four reasons. Uh, members have uh, gone against the recommendation and have decided to grant planning permission uh, for the reasons stated. In relation to conditions, members, um, those uh, obviously, if I could ask, those are just delegated back to officers to attach to the report. 
uh, to the decision notice. They would be standard conditions in relation to the siding and the height of a building, the location, the trees, etc., and access. That's the case. So proposed. Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor McGrath. All agreed with that? Agreed. Yeah. Um, could somebody get Councillor O'Reilly back in? Councillor Rainey, do you want to make some sort of comment? Yeah. <clears throat> Just my apologies for no, late arrival. No, that's chairman. okay. It was already noted at the start, and we knew you were. But if I had, Chairman. No, you, you can't make a comment, sorry. No. Oh. Okay. Indeed, I'm not surprised at I that. I know, well. <laughs> Councillor Devine, um, I would propose a break for us all, please. If that's Could I have a seconder then? Second, Councillor McGuire, right. Agreed. Come back in 10 minutes, please. Quarter past four, quarter past four.
number two, order item four, and that's LA10 bar 2023 bar 1502, the night line for a, a dwelling and carriage. Darren? Okay, Mayor. So, application number two, uh, LA10 2023 1502 slash O, an outline application for dwelling, domestic garage, and associated groundwork uh, on land 60 metres northwest of 334 Core Road, uh, Killy, Co, and Ballon Mallard. The applicant then is Mr. McHugh, and the recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three reasons. There is another application, members, by the same applicant, uh, but we'll to take the two separately as they are two different sites, members. So, this is the first application, 1502. On the screen then is a site location plan. So you can see the uh, co road running along the front of the site. The site then is uh, outlined in red with a, identified by a yellow star and it's set in back off the road and behind the property at the front. The application is accompanied by a plan showing the, the location of the site. Uh, and again, you can see the yellow star then identified where the proposed site is to be located. The access then will come in and out to the red arrow and you can see it says it comes down the existing laneway uh, into the application site. So the site and in relation to other properties you can see number 334 uh, which is between the site and the public road and then 330 which is adjacent to it also at the public road. Now overlaying that then onto the ordnance survey flyover images so the application site then is the yellow star. And you can see the location then in behind the property at the road frontage uh, with the other house nearby. The site is part of a larger field. You can see the shape of it there, a rectangular shape plot roughly, uh, with the core road running along the front of it, all the way up to the, the grey line there, which is a private lane may running in off the core road at the top of that field. So if I just go back, remember, so if you imagine members in that aerial image, you're down at the bottom of that slide, you can see the farm group. And we're down there, we're just working our way along the roads. So that's you at the bottom of that road, looking towards the farm group. And you can see the farm group then is on the left-hand side. The site then is on the other side and behind those trees. So as we go along, you can see the farm group on the left. And then the derail fence then. And that's the house number 330, which is accessed there by that laneway. So you can see the large tree then. And just moving slightly along the road. That's the next property, 334, which is the bungalow with our site then in behind that. Access is proposed down the laneway, which is roughly in the position of that red arrow through the existing trees and things like that there. So moving along the road then to the right-hand side, you can see the, um, the field then that the application site is within and the core road then in front of you. And the application site then is in around the back of those trees on the left-hand side. Going on up the road and turning and looking back down the road, you can see our application site now on the right hand side, uh, identified roughly in the position of the red arrow uh, and at the back of those trees. And just if you're at that position and you turn around again and you go straight on up the core road, you can see you're heading along the large field that the site's taken out of and the house on the right hand side. Continue along there. You have another house on the right hand side. And you keep going up and you can see then the top of the, the field that the site is in is on the left hand side and there's an entrance then into a private laneway which runs down there and marks uh, defines the boundary at the top of that field there's a house in number, number 334 uh, which you can't actually see on the the street view images um, but it is in there and that's just as you move further along the road you can see into number three the laneway then which serves down into 334 so if you look, members, the area of land between that house and the road is uh, overgrown by the scrub vegetation uh, and trees and bushes there. Well, just to look then at the context of the site again, so the application then with the new plan strategy, you have the rounding off and infill policies, which obviously are relevant. In this case here, we have number 330, uh, the farm group, number 330 and 334, which are along the road frontage. Uh, our site then is in at the back of those. You then have a large gap over to the laneway, which serves down into number 344. So you can see there are three houses there, um, but number 344 is set back away and off the road, and our site is in behind number 334. So it's not in the gap between the buildings, it's actually at the back. Uh, in terms of the reason for refusal members, you'll note there is a road safety issue. So uh, DFI roads advise there is a hump in the road or a crest of the road. And you can see there on the Google Street View image on the right hand side, the yellow line, there's a slight rise in the land there. Uh, and if the access is to come out where it's proposed, 
the visibility then to the left hand side is uh, you can't see over that hump so you cannot see ongoing traffic so DFI roads have actually advised that the access is unsafe in that position uh, and should be amended to move on up the road to come out at the top of the crest uh, and if it is moved up there then it would safely come out and you can see left and right so that would require an amendment to the application members but can be done under this application so just to go through the reasons for refusal is quantity HUE 13 uh, for the various reasons listed it's not a running off opportunity and it's not an infill opportunity as well members for the reasons listed within your report so for the reasons listed within the report and in line with the wording of the transition arrangements uh, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together the proposal does not accord with the plan strategy for the reasons stated and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved contrary to the uh, the reasons recommended the application is refused for the following reasons so it's not a rounding off opportunity it's not an infill it would result in suburban style build up when viewed with the other buildings it would create a ribbon of development and the access will prejudice road users Thanks very much, Sharon. We've got speaking rights from uh, the agent. I don't think the applicant is in attendance. So, Morris, if you could move up to either three or four, it doesn't matter which. You have 10 minutes to present, or up to 10 minutes, after which we may or may not ask you questions. If you could just introduce yourself, Morris, if you're ready to go. Yeah, okay. Thank you. There you are. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee, and thank you, Darren, and Planning Service, for your indulgence in this matter. Um, this application has been deferred twice for uh, reasons beyond both mine and the applicant's control. So I, I do thank you for your indulgence in the matter. Um, <clears throat> the applicant, Mr. McHugh, has speaking rights, but unfortunately he can't be here today himself. So I've asked Councillor um, Armstrong to speak as well. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the application and the, uh, the intention to refuse, um, <clears throat> The planning report as prepared by the planning service is it's it's forensic it's it's definitive but it's also prescriptive and i have to say that's that's how it should be that's why we have a planning service uh, we we uh, we don't wish to see untrammeled development in the countryside it's it's a commonly held opinion and uh, i agree with that but there are mitigating circumstances and uh, in the submission um, in the application i did outline the uh, the applicant's personal circumstances uh, i think that uh, darren and his team have taken note of those but i do acknowledge that these are not not material however i would like um if they could possibly be borne in mind um <clears throat> as i said the uh, the uh, the report is is prescriptive and uh, it's uh, it's uh, of uh, significant content, but effectively, as we've seen in the in the previous number of applications here, it, it effectively distills down to HOU thirteen. Now, um, I was uh, uh, hot, I suppose, if you want to put it like that, in the transition. Uh, arrangement as well when I was having my initial consultations with the with the client uh, we were we were um, how would you say uh, we were conscious of the fact that uh, in the in the old um, dispensation the town land uh, Kili Co was part of a dispersed rural community and that indicated to us that there was there was a will uh, to to allow for uh, population growth in in uh, in this particular in this particular area. Uh, however, I do accept that with um, <clears throat> as as things have have uh, panned out, we are now being determined under under uh, the the new LDP, and we have to run with that. However, as I said, the the report is it's onerous, and uh, it. Uh, <clears throat> It does uh, it, it does make demands, uh, which basically, if if we were all able to sort of fulfil the demands of the 
of the, the, the policy, uh, there would be no need for me to be here. There would be no need for me to be asking for the committee's discretion in the matter. Uh, no site is perfect. Uh, we, do our, we do our utmost to uh, be plan policy compliant, I guess is how you would put it. We, do, we don't... Um, uh, we don't uh, set out to fly in the face of policy. But what I am asking today is that, uh, that the committee take a strong look, a good hard look at, at this site and uh, accept what I'm saying on it is that uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to address the concerns of the of planning service. <clears throat> And basically, effectively, what's happening is that uh, we are we are uh, we are being determined on uh, HOU thirteen, as I said, and <clears throat> I think that uh, we can we can effectively round off this site. Um, is it possible to look at drawing KMK zero one, uh, Darren, or KMK zero two, whichever is. Uh, in, in, the, in the first instance, uh, we chose this site because basically the, the, the land outlined in blue, which is the, the applicant's uh, holding, um, uh, the site is actually, uh, and it has been demonstrated uh, uh, in uh, Darren's submission, that the site is barely vis visible at all from the road. This is why we chose it. It's 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 completely screened, but I would also submit that uh, it's bounded on one side by uh, dwelling number three three four, uh, Coal Road, uh, and I would also contest that uh, there is a second there is a second sort of, uh, boundary interface from number three three thirty. If you if you look at the site closely, you can see that uh, that it is bounded on two sides. It also, uh, if, if developed, to my mind, uh, it, it, would, it would form a new cluster. If you look at, uh, Darren, maybe could we have uh, drawing KMK01? That's the, is that possible? It shows the location plan. Yeah. <laughs> if, you just, uh, if you just look at, look at that drawing, you can see yourselves for, uh, how the settlement patterns have, have uh, evolved in the area. And I would submit that should we uh, put a dwelling or a number of dwellings in the, in the vicinity of uh, house dwelling number 334, we would be mirroring uh, the cluster, which is just up the road to the northeast. And this is what I'm asking uh, the committee's discretion on. The applicant is uh, is a native, uh, uh, born and bred in the area. The piece of land uh, that the site falls into was was willed to him by his parents, who have uh, uh, passed away in the last number of years, uh, in the hope that he would come and live in the area. Uh, so I'm asking for your indulgence in the matter, committee. Thank you. Okay, Morris, thank you very much indeed, within the time. Members, any questions for Morris? Not saying anything? Okay, could you rest back to your seat, Morris, for this one? We have representation tonight from a public representative. I, I believe you know who it is, Councillor Diana Armstrong. And, uh, You've got the hot seat. Yep, you have five minutes, Diana. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on uh, on behalf of the um, the applicant, Kevin McHugh. Kevin um, has a family connection with this site, and I would like to speak in support of his um, application. Um, I think. He has, as I said, he has family roots in the area and he has a desire to return here to be able to continue his career 
and, and also contribute to the local economy by working from home in a new dwelling in this area. Historically, Fermanagh and Oma Council, Fermanagh Council itself, many, many years ago, um, indicated that they wanted to see population growth in the area of the Cali Co Road. And obviously things have changed under different area plans and the local development plan. And as the agent said, unfortunately, this has been caught in between in the transition phase between the two plans with the new LDP and its new stipulations. And we're seeing this among many other applications, similar, similar um, constraints here where applications have fallen between the two, um, the two new plan, the two plans. Um, so as I said, behind this application, there is an applica applicant wanting to return to his roots and, and contribute to the local economy. I think as the agent pointed out, if there was a cluster effect gained by this, this being approved, it would mirror a cluster further up that small rural road and that sense of community. It does, I note, um, um, the report says that it does meet the test of general amenity and integration, which is positive. Um, I think it is visually, um, the visual impact is minimal from where that is. And I think that is, that's to the benefit of the application. It's interesting also to note that the regional development strategy supports the development of small settlements in the countryside and it um, supports the development of a strong, diversified and competitive rural economy and a living, working countryside. So I would, I would um, state that this is part of the regional development strategy to support that ethos and just ask members to consider this. I hope they consider, consider it in a positive light. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diana. If you could return to your seat, thank you. Darren? Uh, no further comments. <coughs> decision time. And that's not the online one. It's where you make the decision, members. Any questions for Darren? No, not seeing anything. You don't have to be shy, you know, we all know each other. Councillor McGrath, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. No, just Darren's advice on the application being caught in the middle. What can you give us in what your view on that is? Um, it's not my view, it's the, the, the policy. Um, the SPPS says that once we adopt our new plan strategy, those policies are the ones in play, uh, and the old ones are no longer material or relevant, so they're not so. You have to go with the new plan strategy policies. Okay, thank you, Darren. Councillor Devine Gallagher, Roisin. Thank you, Chair. Um, Darren, um, the agent there spoke about special circumstances. Um, could you can you elaborate on what they are? Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I, I don't know what those were. Um, um, unless there's an email being sent in that hasn't been sent in my direction, but I wasn't made aware of any special circumstances. Per se, otherwise those would have been included in the report. Um, also, um, the um, agent there said and noticed that um, the house wouldn't be seen. Um, so does that take away the chances of a urban development? Does that remove that? Um, no. No? Okay. Sorry, I'm just asking the question. <laughs> well, if you don't ask, you won't get your answer, Oshin. Any further questions? We can't sit here all night, gentlemen and ladies. Councillor McCann, Stephen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Thanks to, to Morris and to Councillor Armstrong for their presentations as well. Uh, just looking at the reasons for refusal, uh, I know the area quite well. I can I can identify with the with the cluster points that the agent is referring to. Uh, in terms of the reasons for refusal, Darren, uh, 
reason A, the proposed dwelling will not result in the round knob of a gap within an existing group of buildings which are sited outside a farm. So we'll just come back to the to the drawing if I can there, Dart. <coughs> So it's the uh, the aerial photograph. Yeah. So the right now for the gap. Okay. So the site is not visually linked with an into, with an existing group of buildings constituting a minimum of four buildings, three of which which be dwellings within their own defined cartilage. And the rest of the reasons, you know, I'd be able to obviously deal with, but these ones has, has, has caused me an issue. Uh, obviously, the, the policy is clear. Uh, in terms of the roads, so the DFA roads uh, consultation response, uh, is the ownership, is, is the land ownership, is it possible basically to get access to the road where DFA have, have suggested if this is approved? Is that within the Okay, that's all, Chair. Right. Okay, anything further, members? Paul? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And members, it's just, I suppose, a point of clarity. Um, I know there's a transition to our new plan strategy, um, and this application was under PPS 21, but, you know, I, I, I it wouldn't have fitted within any of the policies within PPS 21 either. So it's not that it's was potentially going to be approved and now it's getting refused. It, it wouldn't have been acceptable in principle under PPS 21 either. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Paul. Councillor McCrockery, John. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering is there is there any was there any discussions around alternatives? This is the, the owner's only I'm assuming only property on the co road. Was there any I know that's a specific bit that they've picked. Was there any alternatives, or, or is there anything else that would fit in, into the into the policy in that field? Or is that the only option in that field? The applicant has applied for two houses, so this is the first. There's a second one coming along now after this application, which is in the same field, and has been recommended for refusal as well. Okay. Is, is that? Is there any any alteration to the layout that would have fitted policy, perhaps? Um, um, it, to this application, or for uh, both of them, even? Uh, uh, um, this, we not, don't want to prejudge the second one. Yeah, first is the first and most important thing here, um, because we're always under intense scrutiny. Um, so in this application here, there's no suggestions by planning officers that would overcome the issues. To me, looking at it, it's a fairly black and white case uh, in terms of policy assessment, unfortunately. Any further questions? We really do have to come towards a uh, proposal. You must have taken something when you were on your break, I think. Was it a mince pie? Councillor McCrockery, John. Um, sorry, Chair. I'm. We seem to be at the sort of a standoff here, and and uh, I I can't see how we're resolving this, and I hate to be the bad guy, and I hate, but I I, I can't see how we can't go with the officers' recommendations, and and, and we're all going to sit here and they're going to wait for somebody to break, and and I'm going to be the one to break, and I'll propose it if somebody else will second. That Thank you very much, John. Proposal. I have a proposal from John to go with his officer's recommendation to refuse. Do I either have a seconder or I do have a contrary proposal? Oh, 
Sorry, Tom, I didn't see there. Tom, Councillor O'Reilly. Chair, I'm prepared in the circumstances that's facing us here with the, the numbers or, or the number of reasons for uh, refusal to second uh, the recommendations. Is that okay? Thanks very much, Tom. Stephen, are you still on in? Yep. There you go, Councillor McCann. Stephen. Thank you, Chairman. Just a brief comment. I suppose you know, uh, in principle, I can understand the concept from where the agent and the applicant are coming from. But uh, in terms of, of being policy compliant and, and getting this across the line in line with our LDP and with the, with a large number of reasons for refusal, it's just unfortunate that we can't, you know, that we can't overcome them in this particular site, you know. So uh, I'll be abstaining from the vote, Chair. It's okay. We have a proposal um, from Councillor Crocky, seconded by Councillor Riley, to go with his officer's recommendation to refuse. Are we all agreed? Hold on. Just put put your hand up if you're agreeing. Uh, against? Abstention? Three abstentions. Councillor McCann, Devine Gallagher and Rainey. That's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Darren? Uh, okay, members. So application number two, LA10 2023, two, sorry, LA10 2023-1502. Uh, the recommendation of officers was to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three reasons. Members have refused planning permission for those three reasons. Thank you very much. We'll go on to the next application. That's application number three, LA10, bar 2023, bar 1500. Well, number application three then, uh, LA10, 2023, uh, 1500. It's an outline application by Mr. McKeel for a proposed dwelling house, domestic guides and associated groundwork. Approximately 75 metres northeast of 334 Core Road, uh, Killeague Core and Balda Mallard. Uh, the recommendation of officers then is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three reasons. Remember well, again, just to go through the details on the screen then is the site location plan. So this site is a road frontage plot uh, facing directly onto the Core Road and uh, is outlined in red then on the screen with the wider field then outlined in blue. as uh, identified with the yellow star. So again, the agent has provided a block plan, and you can see the location of the site then with the yellow star on it, uh, and the annotation proposed site. So it is uh, adjacent to number 334, uh, which is beside number 330 in the farm group, and then you have number 331 across the road from the site. So putting that into the context, members, just to set the aerial flyover image in front of you, you can see the location of the site is the yellow star. Uh, again, members, just for information, that's purely for reference only. Um, uh, the, the red star is the previous site uh, that has just been decided by the committee. So this application then is on the front road frontage field. So you can see the farm group and the two houses uh, to the southwest, uh, and then the larger field then running up towards the laneway with the other buildings then nearby on the other side of the road. So again, members, just to take some Google Street View images here. So if we're at the bottom of the site again, or at the bottom of the slide, down at the farm. You can see there the red arrow, and we're looking up towards the application site. So again, that's us on the core road, traveling up towards the farm group, which is on the left-hand side. Come along, and you have the farm group, and then you have the D-rail fence again, and that's number 330. Moving along the road then is number 334. And then if you look to the right, members, you can see the crest in the road, and that's the location then of our site with the approximate position of the entrance into our site and our site then is a road frontage plot so again turning around and looking back on yourself the site is a road frontage uh, rectangular plot cut out of the larger field with the boundaries beside the boundaries end of those existing trees and hedges turning around again going back on continuing along the core road you can see the houses on the right hand side and another one on the right hand side and then you come to the laneway down into 344 um, and that's the lane way down at the 344. Uh, obviously, the site uh, has an opportunity to be considered under the infill opportunity uh, of HUU 13. So it is a road frontage plot. You have 330, you have the farm group, you have 330, and then 334. You then our application site in the larger field, and then you run on up the field towards number 344. Uh, so again, just overlaying that uh, the application site onto the map to give you an approximate position uh, of what we're, we're uh, being asked to consider. 
and you can see on the left hand image is the red line of the site overlaid onto that aerial image. That site then is part of a larger gap of 160 metres across that site frontage. And when you overlay the site onto that, uh, regrettably there's room for three houses um, within the gap between the house and the laneway at the top. Uh, you'll know from the policy members that the infill policy allows a maximum of two. So having regards to the policy context, there's room for three, clearly room for three, um, and therefore it doesn't uh, fall within the infill policy. So the recommendation then is county HU 13 for the reasons listed. It doesn't meet the rounding off policies as well for a variety of reasons, um, but also does meet the infill opportunity um, as there's uh, opportunity for more than two houses. So for the reasons listed within the report in line with the wording of the transitional arrangements uh, within the regulations, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the plan strategy or the SPBS for the reasons stated. And there are no other material considerations to indicate that the application should be approved contrary to the, the plan strategy. Recommend the application is refused for the following reasons. So it's not a rounding off, it's not an infill. It would also result in a suburban buildup of development uh, along the edge of the road. The field is an important visual break between the existing buildings in the area. Uh, the site also doesn't provide a suitable degree of enclosure. Uh, there's no boundaries to the critical two sides. And it would also uh, add to ribbon of development in line with the two other houses of farm group and extend that along the edge of the road. So the recommendation members is to refuse, subject to the reasons in the report. Thank you very much. We've got speaking rights again, uh, again with uh, Morris Allen, or Morris Keen, sorry. Morris, would you bring us up to... Again, you have 10 minutes, Morris. There you go. Uh, well, quite frankly, Chair, I don't think I'll need 10 minutes. Um, I think I might uh, make a change of strategy here. And given what has uh, come to pass in the, in the last, the previous discussion, uh, might I ask, uh, given that there is opportunity for three dwellings, as Darren has pointed out, uh, is there any way that we could have some further dialogue with planning that we could assist Mr. McHugh in his in his desire to come and live in his native townland? Hold on, Darren. Yep. Obviously, planners are very happy to engage in discussions about app with applicants and uh, see if there are alternative arrangements. Uh, but in terms of this application, it needs determined. We have statutory targets. We, you know, I always say that. We're here to make decisions on applications. Um, the suggestion, though, about getting three in the gap, three would not be permitted because the policy only allows for a maximum of two. So that's not going to assist the applicant going forward. If there are other issues, farming case, personal circumstances, whatever else there is, certainly we can look at those outside of this application. But I think the file has been in long enough. It's it's really one that's a decision needed on it. That doesn't stop discussions afterwards, though. I won't predetermine the discussion any further, Morris, but I think if you need to actually uh, engage uh, in regard to the possibilities for Mr. McHugh, I think that should be done outside this. We will have to look at this application as it is, and as Darren said, there are reasons for refusal. We could defer, but we will only defer, basically, if there are good reasons to defer, and that will be a judgment call from the members. But there may be possibilities, but that's um, a discussion that you'll have to have um, pursuant after this meeting. Okay. Uh, Do you I, want to say anything further? Uh, is it possible at this juncture to withdraw the application? Yeah, you can withdraw, yes. I, yep. I think that is probably our best course of action, Chair. Well, are you saying now you're just you're, you're going to withdraw now? You're going to advise the applicant to withdraw? Uh, I will do, yes. Right. Well, then we as a planning committee don't need to take any further action then if that's your stated intention on behalf of the applicant. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. And then you can continue the conversations yeah. after that. Okay. That's if you fine. dress back, we'll just yeah. take that on board, Morris. Thank you. And Diana, you don't have to speak any further.
Just right. Just uh, I think right. just will, Darren will sum up, but I think the uh, agent on behalf of the applicant pursuant to the conversation with regard to the previous application and the conditions really uh, surrounding his desire has said um, the intention is to withdraw the application. So we need as a committee to take no further action, Darren. Yeah, so the recommendation of officers and members was to refuse. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the agent has indicated the application will be withdrawn. Thank you very much. That's, that is done. I have note that's withdrawn. We'll now move on to item number five, and that's to note the schedule of planning decisions issued in November 2023. Any questions? If not, could I have a proposal and second note? Councillor McCann, Councillor Thompson, all agreed? All agreed, thank you. We'll go on to item six, and that's the report on proposal of a PAN. Any questions in that regard? You will note the PAN was lodged, but this has taken place. It took place towards the end of uh, November. Um, any questions? If not, proposer and seconder to note, please. Councillor Devine Gallagher, Councillor McGrath, all agreed? Great, thank you. Go on now to correspondence. I think I have three items of correspondence. First item is from the um, Department for Infrastructure, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, and members. Uh, this is really just a notification for, from uh, Suzanne Napier um, from the from DFI Analysis, Statistics and Research Branch. And it's basically just to say that the quarter two uh, plan and statistics would have been published today. So we'll bring a substantive report back in, in January, members, in relation to that. Thanks, Chair. Okay, that was just for noting, members. Second, um, yeah, well, um, seconder to note, Pro Councillor Thompson and Councillor Mann. Thank you. Second one is from DFI again as well. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, members, this is a notification uh, regarding a public consultation and the review of the Development Management Regulations 2015. Uh, I suppose this is part of a, a wider regional plan and improvement programme and, and follows correspondence that we had received back in May of this year um, when we were invited to share our experiences in, in terms of the thresholds. So you can see that the consultation focuses on, on a number of different areas, three different areas to be exact. So. I think we'll take a bit of time to review uh, those areas, members, and we'll bring a report back um, in February and the closing date then is early March. Thanks, Chair. Propose to note, please. Councillor Devine Gallagher and Councillor McCann, well done. Thank you. Uh, third one is from Diera, or NIEA, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, again, this is a, a letter from Liz Lochran, uh, Director of Natural Environment Division, NIA, um, and it's providing a further update in, re in relation to the uh, existing uh, ammonia operational protocol. Uh, and members, this is a continuing moving picture. Uh, you remember correspondence from Mark Hammond, uh, which we had received on the 29th of September and discussed at the October Planning Committee meeting where NIA advised that they were lifting the pause um, and resuming offering uh, consultation responses based on the existing protocol. So um, I suppose at that time we had thought it was a strange position uh, given the context of a consultation on the on the protocol. Um, so this latest cor correspondence members is just advising that uh, DERA has asked um, NIA to place a short pause on its use of the operational protocol again. Um, and so NAA, NAA will not be providing any advice and planning applications uh, in the coming days. Um, you'll know members of the comment, uh, this is allow, they allow the department to consider some further new developments uh, related to the use of the protocol. So um, Liz apologizes for the inconvenience and you'll note that we'll be updated um, on the position uh, by Friday the 22nd of December. Right. That's a feeling. Yeah, thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just very strange that under the, the, the um, pause now, it's, it's going to slow up things more so, so will it? Or, or just sounds very strange. So it's, it's not going to help any. And I'm going to note it, but just very strange. I think th th those are kind words, I think, Anthony. Uh, yeah, you're proposing to note. I think we could go into a discussion here for about an hour about them, but we won't. Um, could have a seconder, Councillor O'Reilly. Thanks very much indeed. 
I got um, no indication of uh, any other um, business, so I'm going to go straight into confidential. I need a proposer and seconder. Councillor McGrath and Councillor Thompson, thank you. Could we suspend the recording, please?
the and uh, bring sorry the report in relation to the advertisement and notification of planning applications. They considered the report on the annual housing monitored and received an update in relation to the submission of um, misrepresented soil sample analysis reports um, and also an update on application LA10 slash 2021 forward slash 0511F. Um, and uh, that concludes the confidential business. Could have a proposal and second to note that, Councillor Thompson, Councillor McGuire. That's it. Thank you very much. Meeting closed. As I said before, have a good Christmas and New Year.